This is the Humanist Report with Mike Figueredo. The Humanist Report podcast is funded by viewers like you through Patreon and PayPal. To support the show, visit patreon.com forward slash humanist report or become a member at humanistreport.com. Now, enjoy the show. Welcome to the Humanist Report Podcast. My name is Mike Figueredo, and I hope you're all having a fantastic week. This is episode 217, and it is Friday, November 7th, and we have got quite a bit to talk about on today's program, namely the Bernie Blackout. But before we get to that, as usual, I want to thank all of our newest Patreon, PayPal, and YouTube members who signed up to support the show this week. And that includes Anna Valencia, Audio Guy, Ben Rose, David Earnhardt, Dermazel Kiesmata, Deborah Grossbach, Gray Peterson, Jason Cole, Jeffrey Hyde, Jonathan Crisp, Jay Schwindelbeck, Ken O'Dowd, Lauren S., Richard Paradis, and Tossin Ajik too. So thank you so much to all of these kind individuals. If you'd also like to support the independent progressive media revolution, you could do so by going to humanistreport.com slash support, patreon.com forward slash humanistreport, or by clicking join underneath any one of our YouTube videos. So this week on a jam-packed show, we'll talk about the Bernie blackout in the mainstream media and their attempt to completely erase him from the 2020 race. Matt Bevin loses in Kentucky. Amazon takes on a socialist superstar in Seattle. Billionaires cry about the wealth tax literally. Elizabeth Warren proposes a plan to finance Medicare for All. Dave Rubin shares his high-level ideas with Tucker Carlson. Joe Biden demonstrates why he's the absolute worst. Ben Shapiro proves why he's clueless about the issue of healthcare. Fox News responds to a Bernie Sanders and Ilhan Omar rally with the usual attack. Climate change will cause mass human suffering, so that's certainly something that we can look forward to. And a new Justice Democrats-like organization called Matriarch Launches that is the progressive of answer to Emily's list. And finally on the program, we'll close the show by talking to 2020 congressional contender from New Jersey, Russ Siracione, about his race against incumbent Democrat Frank Pallone. So that's what we've got on the agenda for today's program. Hopefully you guys will enjoy the show. Let's go ahead and dive right in. The mainstream media has made it crystal clear that they do not like Bernie Sanders and they want to defeat Bernie Sanders. Now, what are they doing to try to defeat Bernie Sanders? Well, they're just pretending like he doesn't exist. And the ways that they are ignoring him are so conspicuous, so brazen, that their agenda is crystal clear. They are trying to erase Bernie Sanders from the 2020 race. And throughout the course of this video, I'm hopefully going to demonstrate to you that this is pretty painfully obvious. Now, in case you don't know, for those of you who only watch the mainstream media, Bernie Sanders is, in fact, surging currently, contrary to popular belief. When you look at Real Clear Politics polling averages, he's on the rise and nearly closed the gap between him and Elizabeth Warren. He also surpasses all other candidates when it comes to voter enthusiasm, with 52% of his supporters extremely excited to vote for him, and 61% definitely voting for him. A new Monmouth poll found that he's far ahead of Biden and Warren when it comes to youth voters, and also a new Reuters Ipsos poll found that voters view him as the best candidate on healthcare, the economy and jobs, immigration, and the environment. So, make no mistake about it, the Bernie Sanders surge is really Real. But you wouldn't know about that if you watched the mainstream media, because what they're choosing to talk about is the surge of Pete Buttigieg, who on average is polling at 7%. So he's in fourth place. Now, there's been a couple of recent polls that show him doing well in early primary states, but overall, there's been endless coverage of Pete Buttigieg praising him with comparisons to Obama on CNN and MSNBC, and they also are praising Warren because they're trying to pitch her as the go-to alternative for progressives during the Democratic Party primary because, of course, they don't want Bernie Sanders to win because he's the worst in their view. And when it comes to Pete Buttigieg, the reason why the media is trying to prop him up is because he's their backup plan in the likely event that Joe Biden does fail. Now, the reason why this matters, the reason why them ignoring Bernie Sanders matters is because this has a real substantial impact on the state of the race. So if you read any social science research on the mainstream media and the effect that they have, they have agenda setting powers. They have the ability to raise the salience of particular issues in your mind that they think is more important. And on top of that, they have the ability to unilaterally pick and choose winners and losers in elections simply by covering them a lot 
or not covering them. Donald Trump is president largely because the media gave him $2 million, excuse me, $2 billion with a B of free advertising. And even if that coverage was negative, just the mere fact that they talked about him so much made it seem as if he was a legitimate candidate and a legitimate contender when he was a clown, not to be taken seriously, but since the media covered him because they prioritized their ratings over the country, well, that's the situation that we're currently in, largely due to the mainstream media. Now, Bernie Sanders is someone who they're trying to defeat by ignoring him, because if they don't talk about Bernie Sanders, then psychologically speaking, individuals who don't hear as much about Bernie Sanders from the mainstream media will just automatically assume that Bernie Sanders isn't a real contender, when he very much is, in fact, a contender, and when he's surging, that's when they should be theoretically talking about him the most if they were actually fair and balanced but we know that they're not. But by ignoring Bernie Sanders and trying to erase him from this entire election cycle, they are misinforming their viewers. And there are various examples. And by the time we're done with this video, you're going to see that there's no way that this is coincidental. It's not coincidental. So journalist Ryan Grimm points out how CNN cited a poll from New Hampshire where the results are flipped. So if you look at the poll on the right side of the screen, it shows that Warren is at 21% and Sanders is at 18%. But in actuality, it's Warren who's the one that's at 18% and Sanders who's at 21%. In other words, he's beating her, but that's not the way that they presented that information. And presumably they have issued zero corrections thus far. Now on top of that, Ryan Grimm tweeted, CNN has five articles up about its new New Hampshire poll that shows Sanders in front, yet none of the five say that in the headline. For example, Buttigieg in fourth, but a strong fourth. Another example of a headline, this is a historically unprecedented New Hampshire mess. Early state primary voters much more undecided than voters nationally. On top of that, there's this one, a disappointing poll for Biden. And the most charitable out of all of these, Sanders and Warren sit at top in New Hampshire, but there's no clear frontrunner. Now, let me remind you, these are all headlines that are citing a poll that found out that Bernie Sanders was, in fact, in first place. But that's not all, because on top of that, Twitter user JB3 points out, CNN's headline from the same poll where Bernie is three points ahead of Warren includes a banner that says, no clear leader. No clear leader when he clearly is in the lead. Now, on top of that, journalist Ken Klippenstein points out that this New York Times notification completely ignores the existence of Bernie Sanders. It says, Elizabeth Warren is leading a tight Iowa caucus race, according to our new poll, while Pete Buttigieg is surging and Joe Biden is fading. They completely left out Bernie Sanders. Now, when you look at that actual poll, you'll see that Bernie Sanders is in second place. No mention of a Sanders surge or the fact that he's in second place. They reference Elizabeth Warren, Pete Buttigieg, and Joe Biden make no mention of Bernie Sanders whatsoever. Now, CNN reported on that poll with a lower third that talks about how Biden and Buttigieg are in striking distance of Warren, but no mention of Bernie Sanders. On top of that, this tweet from Lorraine, who shares a screenshot from MSNBC, completely excludes Bernie Sanders from their list of presidential contenders, even though they included Michael Bennett and Marianne Williamson, who are both polling at 0.5 and 0.4% respectively. No mention of Bernie there. And Lorraine also brings attention to this CNN lower third where it reads, Warren outpaces Biden in third quarter fundraising. Now, as you can see, Bernie came in first and he also outpaced Biden. No mention of Bernie Sanders in that lower third. And let's not forget about the Washington Post because as Dr. James Zogby pointed out on Twitter, the Washington Post reported on a poll where it finds that voters say Bernie best understands the problems of ordinary people. But in spite of that, the headline reads, quote, as Warren and Buttigieg rise, the Democratic presidential race is competitive and fluid, a Washington Post ABC News poll finds. Again, Bernie was at the top of all three questions while Buttigieg was in fourth, yet he's in the headline about this poll. So you get the point. Those are just a few examples. But if I wanted to, I could go on and on and on and on about all of the instances where a corporate-owned news outlet is very conspicuously trying to erase Bernie Sanders by not mentioning that he even is running for president anymore. None of this is coincidental. None of it. This is a concerted effort by corporate-owned news outlets to erase Bernie Sanders because he's a threat and they don't like him. Do you honestly believe that 
these journalists in corporate media are not aware of the influence that they have? Do you think that they don't know about the agenda-setting powers and their ability to uh, pick winners and losers simply by either ignoring a candidate completely or over-covering them? They know about this social science research. They're aware of that. They're smart people. So this is all intentional. You can say maybe a couple mistakes here and there. That's understandable. But we're seeing time and again them try to erase Bernie Sanders from the conversation. And they're doing this at a time when he's surging, which is when there would be potentially more momentum for him. Because the reason why they keep telling you about the Buttigieg surge is because they want you to get behind Buttigieg. If you see that he's the candidate with all of the momentum now, then maybe you should back him if you truly want to beat Donald Trump. Because what a lot of voters do, and perhaps even unintentionally, is they just kind of gravitate towards the candidate who um, they think has the best chance at winning. I don't know why people do that, but if you're just kind of a casual political observer, oftentimes you do this. Media knows this. And that's why they're trying to ignore Bernie Sanders so you don't even think he's an option. Now, thankfully, Bernie Sanders' team, namely David Sirota, has spoken out about this, and they've called out what is obviously a Bernie blackout. And even in the coverage of the Bernie blackout, the tone that journalists use to describe it pretty much proved the point. They don't like Bernie Sanders. Take this article from The Hill, for example, written by Jonathan Eastley and Max Greenwood. Quote, Senator Bernie Sanders' presidential campaign is accusing the media of ignoring his quote-unquote surge in the polls. That quotation there is pretty telling. Uh, as the Vermont Independent looks to stage a comeback. Sanders has jumped in new surveys of New Hampshire with the latest CNN University of New Hampshire poll, finding him with the lead in the Granite State, which he won with 60% of the vote in the 2016 Democratic presidential primary. Sanders has also seen a small bump in some national polls and surveys of Iowa, although he does not lead anywhere else. Now, keep in mind, these are two very key primary states that are the reason why they're citing Pete Buttigieg as surging because he's doing well in these early primary states, so far, according to some polls. They go on, the Sanders campaign is fuming at the media, alleging the political press is playing favorites, particularly with Senator Elizabeth Warren and South Bend, Indiana Mayor Pete Buttigieg, who for weeks have won headlines about how their campaigns are rising in the stretch run to Iowa. Sanders speechwriter David Sirota, whose daily newsletter is a reflection of the campaign's thinking, collected examples of alleged media bias and polling misrepresentations in his latest issue underscored by a headline from the satirical news website The Onion about how Sanders had plummeted two points up in a new poll. In the last week, a wave of polls has emerged, showing a genuine full-on Bernie surge, but you might not know that if you tune into cable TV or read the headlines from the National Press Corps, Sirota wrote. In fact, you might not even know Bernie is running for president, and that is intentional. These media elites no, they're smart people. They know that if they truly want to defeat Bernie Sanders, what is more effective than smearing him is to just ignore him, pretend like he doesn't exist. Now, we know that this is true because Fox News actually talks about Bernie Sanders pretty frequently. Now, 100% of their coverage of Bernie Sanders is negative, but Fox News viewers, according to one recent survey, are more likely to support Bernie Sanders than MSNBC voters. So it goes to show you that ignoring a candidate is more powerful than smearing them nonstop. They're aware of this. They know what they're doing. This is not a coincidence. The Bernie blackout is real, and the corporate media is trying to do whatever they possibly can to put their finger on the scale for anyone but Bernie Sanders. Buttigieg is the alternative to Biden in the event he loses, and Warren is someone who they're trying to shove down our throats as the alternative to Bernie Sanders for progressives. They want you to think there's one option if you're progressive. It's Elizabeth Warren, not Bernie Sanders. But that's not true. But the sad news for them is that in spite of what they're doing to tip the scales against Bernie, he still might win. Because when he had zero national name recognition in 2016, he still overcame, what, a 60-point deficit nationally? So it's possible that we can still win. But in the event, there was this scenario where the media actually gave nonstop fawning coverage to Bernie Sanders. There would be no doubt in my mind he would lead by, like, 10 points in the polls. Because the media has a lot of influence. And when you are someone with more than a million volunteers, you've raised more money than anyone else, 
running for president, taking small grassroots dollar donations when you have an entire movement behind you, that's powerful. If they reported on that in a fair and objective way, I mean, it'd be no competition. Bernie would be the front runner. But that's not the world that we live in. And if we want him to win, then we have to fight. And they're not going to change. They're still going to continue to ignore Bernie Sanders regardless. I mean, he could pull 20 points ahead of Joe Biden. That doesn't matter. They're always going to ignore Bernie Sanders and write him off and never give him the credit that he deserves because he's a threat. So why would they? These are mostly wealthy, privileged people who realize that Bernie Sanders' policies would affect them the most. They don't want a wealth tax. They don't want their taxes to go up. So they're trying to crush the individual out of self-interest who would best represent the American people. And that's a sad fact of reality, and it's why I would encourage everyone to read this book by Noam Chomsky, Manufacturing Consent, because everything he said in here is 100% accurate. I'll leave that there. So after waging a class war on the working class for decades and lobbying the federal government to shift the tax burden away from them and onto the working class, all of a sudden, the rich are wondering why they're getting so much pushback, why we're talking about a wealth tax, why they're being demonized and discriminated against by the working class. Now, if it's not obvious to them by now, it's never going to be obvious because uh, we're sick of it. We are sick of rich people. We're sick of them shifting the tax burden onto us. We're sick of them having it all. So we're at a time where income inequality is at an all-time high, where wealth inequality persists, when people can't even afford to put food on, food on the table, and we have a bunch of whiny billionaires crying, especially now that we're talking nationally about a wealth tax. And I find it absolutely enjoyable because whenever a billionaire cries, um, that makes me very happy. It warms my heart. Now, I want to talk about Leon Cooperman, who is a multi-billionaire hedge fund manager, who has been especially vocal and outspoken about the wealth tax. And he's so mad about the prospect of wealth tax that he penned an angry open letter to Elizabeth Warren after she dared to suggest that billionaires like him should pitch in a little bit more. And in an interview on CNBC, he explained why the wealth tax is a very bad idea. Take a look. Well, I don't need Elizabeth Warren or the government giving away my money. Just tell me what you think the maximum tax rate should be. Stop talking about 2% where, you, where, you, where you're basically misrepresenting the facts. It's 2% of wealth. Just think about this. If Jeff Bezos' wealth is tied up all in Amazon stock, he's going to be forced every year to sell 2% of his stock, regardless of what the outlook is for the company. That's just wrong. It's wrong. It's going to lead to uh, uh, inappropriate actions in the economy that are counterproductive. You're not the only Let one, by the way. You're, you're not the only one who, who makes that point. In fact, I was going through Twitter this morning before, you know, in preparation for our interview, and, and Mark Cuban the other day said a, a very similar thing, wonders about the impact on the stock and other liquidity markets if people like you, uh, other billionaires, maybe Bezos or whoever, uh, is forced to sell stock, for example, to raise cash to deal with a wealth tax. Well, I don't have the problem of concentrated wealth. I'm very diversified. My problem is I think what she's recommending or suggesting is just morally wrong. So let me get this straight. You don't want the government giving away your wealth that you earned, but if they're giving it away, who are they giving it away to and for what? Healthcare? Education? So in other words, you don't want the money that you've made by being a greedy hedge fund manager to be taken from you and given to poor people for healthcare and education, but yet you call a wealth tax morally wrong. You're not the one with the moral superiority here, buddy. You're the one in the wrong. You are the one in the wrong. Now, he tries to reason with us a little bit, and he does this by defending uh, Jeff Bezos. He says, think about this. If Jeff Bezos' wealth is tied up in Amazon stock, he's going to be forced every year to sell 2% of his stock. Okay, Boomer. Great. <laughs> is that supposed to be a negative? Jeff Bezos is the richest human being on the planet. He can afford that. He can afford that. But you see, the way that this individual comes off, and it, I think makes him even more insufferable, is he tries to pitch himself as a reasonable, nonpartisan person. 
and maybe he is nonpartisan. He probably only cares about one thing, his wealth. But he doesn't like Elizabeth Warren. He doesn't want anyone who's even moderately progressive to win. But he also doesn't like Donald Trump. And no, it's not the fascism that he doesn't like about Donald Trump. He doesn't like that Donald Trump isn't presidential enough and is too mean. So he reacted to the state of affairs, the possible choice between, you know, Elizabeth Warren and Donald Trump. And it literally brought him to tears. Not kidding. I mean, I think it's kind of obvious people can not only see the emotion on your face, but hear it in your voice when you talk about this, Lee. Why? I care. That's it. <laughs> that is so pathetic. Wow. <laughs> Life must be so hard for him. I'm so sorry. Like, maybe we are being too hard on billionaires. So let me try to reason with him. He tried to reason with us. Let me try to reason with him. Okay, you don't want the wealth tax. Fine. I'll give you one of two options. Either we impose a wealth tax on the rich or we eat the rich. Which one would you prefer? Because those salty tears would be delicious with your flesh. So pick one. Because like you can only hoard your wealth for so long before the working class, before the peasants take to the streets with pitchforks and come after you directly. So which one do you want? You've been waging this class warfare. Your class has been the ones that initiated this class warfare. We didn't choose to start this, you did. So now we're just responding and we're asking very reasonably so, I think, to pitch in so you can help us out just a little bit, but that's too much. So um, billionaires are absolutely insufferable. And there was a reference to Mark Cuban in that first clip. And I forgot to throw in a fuck you to him as well. But I don't want to be too hard on Mark Cuban, on, you know, Leon Cooperman, because there's another billionaire that I want to talk about, Bill Gates. <coughs> Excuse me. And he's someone who, even though he doesn't like Donald Trump, well, he also isn't too keen on the idea of a wealth tax as well. And he didn't rule out possibly going chud in order to protect his own wealth. Um, okay, so let me make it complicated for you. You've been, um, I'll politely say, public about your misgivings about our current president. If Elizabeth Warren were the other candidate, what would you do? You know, I, I'm not going to, you know, make political declarations, but I do think no matter what policy uh, somebody has in mind, a professional approach uh, is even, as much as I disagree with some of the policy things that are out there, I do think a professional approach to the office. Whoever I decide would have the more professional approach in the current situation <laughs> probably will weigh, is the thing that I'll weigh the most. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I hope the more professional candidate is an electable candidate. But what do you think of this larger idea that underneath all of this, you, you hear people who say there shouldn't be billionaires? in society, that if you really understand what this wealth tax is about, uh, in fact, uh, one of our authors at the New York Times uh, describes it almost as a cigarette tax with the ultimate goal of there being less of it. Um, you know, maybe I'm just too biased to think that if you create a company that's super valuable, that at least some part of that uh, you should be able to have uh, a little bit for consumption and, and hopefully the balance to do philanthropic things. So he was very obviously tap dancing around that question, but by not answering the question, he gave you an answer inadvertently. He would consider voting Donald Trump. He would not rule out voting for Donald Trump and going full chud in order to protect his wealth. Unbelievable. And people like to say that Bill Gates is one of the good billionaires. I hope that this dispels that myth once and for all, there are no good billionaires. If you are a billionaire, if you are greedy enough to get that much wealth, you are inherently a bad person, period. Billionaires should not exist. And yes, we should confiscate that wealth. And if you're against wealth confiscation, then you should be speaking out against a particular type of wealth confiscation that affects the poor and working class. It's called civil asset forfeiture. So if a police officer pulls you over and sees that you have a lot of cash and thinks that maybe that will be used for something illegal, 
they can just take that money from you. So we already have confiscation in this country, and I don't hear the anti-confiscation people speaking out against civil asset forfeiture. So if we can have that go on uncontroversially, then it's time we get real. We need to take their wealth, and really, it's a misnomer to say that that's their wealth, because you can't earn a million dollars. That's not your wealth. You stole that by exploiting the labor of your workers. That's what you did. So really, by taking it back, we're just getting something that you stole from your workers. Period. Now, to really uh, demonstrate how greedy he is, of course, he said that billionaires should exist. That's a shocker. He also went on to talk about how much he's willing to give away because he's he's so charitable, you know? He's known for his philanthropic endeavor endeavors and whatnot. Okay, this is going to prove to you once and for all what a greedy piece of shit Bill Gates is. You know, I've uh, paid over 10 billion in taxes. I paid more uh, than anyone in taxes. Uh, but I, you know, I'm glad to have paid, you know, if I'd had to pay 20 billion, it's fine. Uh, but, you know, when you say I should pay 100 billion, okay, then I'm right. starting to do a little math about, uh, what I have left over, sorry. Uh, I'm just kidding. Uh, uh. <laughs> what a funny joke. Look, he brags about the fact that he paid 10 billion in taxes. Great. He tried to make it seem as if he's reasonable because he'd even be willing to pay 20 billion. But when you start talking about 100 billion, then you're really talking about bleeding him dry. I mean, come on, let's be reasonable here. If we take 100 billion from Bill Gates, What's going to be left for him? Well, I'll tell you. He's worth an estimated $106 billion in net worth. So even if we took $100 billion from Bill Gates, he would still be a multi-billionaire with double the wealth of the first billionaire dickhead we heard from at the beginning of this segment. And Adam Best summed it up perfectly. He says in this tweet, Even if someone was asking Bill Gates to pay $100 billion in taxes, and nobody is, he would still have more money left over than Oprah and Richard Branson combined. In reality, his rate would either be 3% or 8%. The billionaire pity party is pathetic. Now, Warren's wealth tax did tick up to 6% to fund Medicare for all, but regardless... Think about this. Let's put this into a perspective for everyone. Out of every single one of your paychecks, you pay a payroll tax. In some states, you pay a payroll tax to your state government, right? Um, if you own a house, you pay property taxes to a local government. Every time you go to the store, you pay a sales tax on items that you purchase. So you pay all of your taxes. But when we ask billionaires to chip in six to eight cents, this is what happens they throw temper tantrums and become unraveled. And the elephant in the room is that these billionaires don't realize that if Elizabeth Warren is the nominee, um, that's better for them than if Bernie were the nominee because Bernie Sanders is going to be harder on the rich and the billionaire class than Elizabeth Warren would be. So in the event Bernie Sanders were the nominee, could you imagine the reaction? They would be begging for an Elizabeth Warren nomination because Bernie Sanders is that much harder on them because that's what's warranted. If you have $1 billion less than both Leon Cooperman and Bill Gates have, that is a sum of money that is so large you will never be able to spend it in one lifetime, in 10 lifetimes. Because once you've purchased three or four mansions, once you've purchased you know, your dream car and a private jet and a yacht, what do you do? You're never going to be able to spend that money. So what we're talking about here is extreme, extreme wealth. This level of wealth that people like Bill Gates have is unsustainable because in a capitalist system, money equals power. And when you have that much money, you have a lot of power. So what we need to do is tax the hell out of billionaires like Bill Gates and Leon Cooperman. And if they cry, good. Because that means that we're just doing what we need to do to deliver public goods and services to the people in this country who need it the most, the working class and the middle class. So uh, cry me a river. I absolutely have no sympathy for them. Keep crying because it's only making us hate you even more, you greedy pieces of human trash. God damn it! 
If you lose, it sends a really bad message. It just sends a bad, and they will build it up. Here's the story. If you win, they're going to make it like ho-hum. And if you lose, they're going to say, Trump suffered the greatest defeat in the history of the world. This was the greatest. You can't let that happen to me. <laughs> Tuesday night was absolutely brutal for Republicans across the country because, as you all know, Kentucky governor and Trump bootlicker Matt Bevin lost his race to Democrat Andy Bashir. And on top of that, socialist from Virginia Lee Carter won his reelection campaign. Rasheen Aldridge Jr., who was the first Fight for 15 worker to go on strike in St. Louis, won a seat in Missouri's state assembly. And Julie Brisman, known for the viral photo of her flipping off Trump's motorcade, also won a local race that she ran in. So overall, it was a really great night. Although I will say there was one race that so far it seems as if the results are pretty devastating, but we'll get to that in a separate segment. For now, I want to go to the uh, victory speech from Andy Bashir, who not only thanked teachers for his victory, but he also gave a shout out to unions. Tonight, I want to say thank you to our union families that helped make this election happen. So um, that was great. Now, this race in Kentucky was incredibly crucial because it kind of gives us a sense of what to expect in 2020. And if Matt Bevin was vulnerable, then that also could indicate that Mitch McConnell may also be vulnerable too. So that is going to be certainly a behemoth to take down. But this is a really good indication that that's the case. Now, one of my favorite aspects about this story is that Matt Bevin tried to win by tying Andy Bashir to Bernie Sanders and fear-mongering about socialism. Um, but unfortunately for him, obviously, that didn't work out too well. Hi, this is Kentucky Governor Matt Bevin. Today, Sunday, Bernie Sanders, Crazy Bernie, is going to be here in Kentucky. He's here protesting business. He's protesting those who create jobs and opportunity. He thinks that everything should be free. Somehow the job creators should be punished and the people who do or don't work to varying degrees should get everything for free. It doesn't work that way. Anytime someone gets something for free, someone else is paying for it. In this race in 2019 here in Kentucky, you also have people on both sides of this equation. Andy Bashir, who's in line with Bernie Sanders, they share the same party, the same ideology. They share the same values on many fronts. They're both strongly pro-abortion. They both strongly believe your Second Amendment rights should be restricted. They strongly believe that you are people who should be punished if somehow you're out there uh, pursuing the American dream. These are the kind of things that we want to reject here in Kentucky. Not only with Crazy Bernie, but with Andy Bashir this fall in November. This is an opportunity for you to choose, not only in 2019, but again in 2020. The American dream is a real thing. Of and by and for the people really works if we the people take it seriously. Exercise your right to vote. Get out there and let your voice be heard. If you want to side with Andy Bashir and Bernie Sanders, that's your prerogative. But if you believe that America and Kentucky deserve better than that, I ask for your vote November the 5th. It feels so good to watch that knowing that he lost. And this tells me that the tide is turning because fear-mongering about socialism it no longer works. It doesn't even work in Kentucky. That's a really good sign that we are witnessing a paradigm shift. Finally. Now, my favorite line was that he says, Sanders and Andy Bashir believe people should be punished if somehow you're out there pursuing the American dream. Now, he's clearly grasping, but if you think about that, what does that even mean? Like, what are you referring to? Because Bernie Sanders is trying to bring back the American dream because in case you haven't been paying attention, the American dream is dead. The American dream meant that you have economic mobility and you can give your children a better life than what you had. But to him, I'm assuming that the American dream means that, you know, if you rein in large multinational corporations and you expect the elite class to pay their fair share in taxes, then you're against the American dream and you're just being overly punitive. Well, look, this is why you lost, Matt, because you don't understand the needs of working class people. And on top of that, he was the least popular governor in the United States because obviously he wore his contempt for working people 
on his sleeve. But in spite of how horrible he was, it's still genuinely shocking that a Republican lost in the deep red state of Kentucky. But since losing, he refused to concede. And since the margin of victory is fairly thin, if Bevin ends up contesting the results of this, this could be a situation where the race is decided by the state legislature, according to the Senate president. So, I mean, this is a sore loser that we're looking at. He lost because he ran a bad campaign and was a bad governor. Give up, concede, step aside. Your fear-mongering about socialism didn't work. Your fear-mongering about the Democratic Party, even in a deep red state, didn't work. And guess what? Since we successfully came after you, we're coming for Mitch McConnell. Mitch McConnell is absolutely destructive, and any president who is elected will not be able to get their agenda through if Mitch McConnell remains in power. Because if he stays in that seat, he's going to be the Senate Majority Leader for Republicans, um, or Senate Minority Leader. Either way, if he's in leadership, we know he's a very effective leader, and he rightfully called himself the Grim Reaper of socialist policy. It's true, but it's not just socialist policy. He's basically killing everything and stacking the judiciary. So... He's got to go. So if you want to support an opponent of Mitch McConnell who can actually win, who is progressive, then Stephen Cox is your answer. I interviewed him. I brought him on the show. And he's a phenomenal candidate. Support him if you have the means to do so. Phone bank for him. Canvas for him. But either way, you know, this is a good sign of what's to come. And Mitch, we're coming for you next, buddy. I want to take some time to talk about City Councilwoman Shama Sawan of Seattle's 3rd District because this is an individual who is so crucial to the labor movement and she is one of, if not the most effective local politicians in America because she has managed to accomplish what Bernie Sanders says he wants to do, albeit at a local level. So Bernie Sanders talks about wanting to be the organizer-in-chief. Well, she's replicated that strategy at the local level. She has rallied the grassroots in Seattle to take on big business, and guess what? She's really effective. She led the charge for a $15 an hour minimum wage, and now cities across the country are following her lead because she pushed Seattle to do that. She's also fighting for a local Green New Deal. On top of that, she's fighting for public municipal broadband. This is someone who is incredibly effective, and since she's so effective, she has become a target of big business like Amazon. Now, I want to share a now this video with you because she explains the situation and this video is more concise and kind of gives you a really big breakdown than what I can give you. So watch this and then we will explain the results of her election that took place on November 5th. This is part of Gentrification Central. We're standing in the middle of Amazon campus right in front of the Amazon spheres, otherwise colloquially known in, our, in my city as Jeff Bezos' balls. Jeff Bezos and his fellow billionaires have gone to war in this city and in this year's city council elections they are attempting to straight up buy their candidates and do a hostile corporate takeover of City Hall. Seattle is a test lab. If they do this in Seattle, they're going to come after other cities. Seattle is in many ways a microcosm of what's happening in metropolitan areas throughout the nation and the national political situation in general. It is an extremely wealthy city, one of the wealthiest cities in the history of humanity, and yet we have the nation's most regressive tax system. And in the same period that construction has boomed and has made untold millions for property management corporations, the venture capitalists, the big banks, more billionaires and billionaires have been created. In that same period, we are seeing devastating inequality, an explosion in the homelessness crisis, and affordable housing that is at such severe shortage that even the middle class is experiencing an epidemic of economic evictions. And that is why, uh, you know, what happens in Seattle matters to working people and those of us who want social justice in every city throughout the nation. Whenever movements led by working people, ordinary people who are struggling to survive in our 
uh, cities where inequality is growing rapidly. The Wall Street Journal, the Financial Times, all the political pundits that represent the interests of the billionaire class, they say, oh well, aren't you against jobs? Aren't socialists against jobs? And I think it's important for us to point out that we refuse to accept a system where the only terms on which some of us get decent jobs is on terms of allowing every city in every world to be a race to the bottom for most of us. Refusing to accept this race to the bottom is critical. The lessons of the $15 minimum wage show that actually it's the opposite of what the Wall Street Journal will tell you. It's when working people get organized, collectively develop a political analysis and start fighting back, build movements to win victories that are wrested from the hands of the billionaires, not out of their kind hearts, not given to us out of their kind hearts. That's when we are able to win progressive victories like wage increases, like rent control, not just in one city, but in city after city. It's because the uh, confidence that we gain from work, winning in one city, it goes into other cities and, and other cities and yet other cities. Now, it's not just Amazon. I need you to understand what's been happening in Seattle. Whenever she proposes a policy and starts pushing for something, that's when big business starts spending big money. And they are pretty brazen about that. So, of course, we saw what Amazon did once the Seattle City Council passed a head tax in order to stop homelessness. They got the City Council to backtrack. And on top of that, she proposes public municipal broadband, Comcast, and CenturyLink start pouring money in. She proposes rent control, then realtors pour thousands of dollars into the city to stop that. She proposes a local Green New Deal. Puget Sound Energy spends thousands to defeat it. The reason why they're spending so much time, energy, and money trying to stop her agenda is because they know that she poses a real threat. Because when you have the people behind you, you can actually accomplish really amazing things, and she's evidence that that is in fact the case. So she's someone who's incredibly important, right? She may be in Seattle, but she is proving that Bernie's organizer-in-chief strategy is absolutely viable. So if we want things like Medicare for All, even if we don't get money out of politics, even if we don't defeat capitalism, we can still do that so long as we have individuals on the ground fighting for it. Because like any good politician, like any organizer, you know that real change comes from the bottom up, not the top down. So she is using the grassroots to push through an agenda that the people of Seattle desperately want and need. So companies like Amazon, they're not just spending a lot of money to defeat any initiative she's fighting for. They spent a lot of money trying to defeat her, as the Now This video uh, explained. And unfortunately for them, it seems like they might actually get what they want. Because as Owen Higgins of Common Dreams reports, socialist counselor Shama Sawant, one of the company's top targets, told The Guardian that her race had been uphill and that the power of a massive corporation like Amazon stacked against her campaign had been difficult to overcome. We have run a historic grassroots campaign with working people, community members, rejecting Amazon and billionaires' attempts to buy this election, and that doesn't mean we're going to win every battle against the billionaires, said Sawan. What matters is the political clarity that the billionaires are not on our side and that this is going to be a struggle. Seattle is still waiting for the final results in the race. Washington has a mail-in voting system that makes final counts unavailable for for days after voting, but as of Wednesday, it looked likely that Sawan and fellow socialist Sean Scott were headed for defeat against Amazon-backed candidates like Egan Orion and Alex Peterson, respectively. Neither Scott nor Sawan had conceded at press time. Now, at the time I'm recording this video, it still doesn't look good, but it's not over yet. And as Sarah Jaffe, a journalist, points out, let's remember that mail-in voting in Washington state means Shama Sawan's race is not over. Yes, she's trailing. Yes, it's because of Amazon money and frankly, because some comfortable liberals find her too radical. But let's not write her off yet. So it's not over until it's over, but the reason why I'm talking about this is because this is an incredibly important race. If she's able to defeat Amazon in spite of all of the money that they're spending to defeat her and her agenda, that really demonstrates how powerful labor and organized grassroots movements are. 
and it will reflect what we're able to accomplish at the national level. So we all have a vested interest in making sure that she is successful. Well, let me just say something. In the event she loses, we don't know that that's going to be the case, but if she actually does lose to the corporate shill that was running against her, then this is not the end of Shama Sawant, by no means. Um, this is a defeat in one battle, but rather than trying to defeat Councilwoman Sawant, Amazon's going to have to defeat Representative Sawant or Senator Sawant because she's not going anywhere. So this is an incredibly important race that I want you to pay close attention to. And I tried to bring Shama on my show last week. Unfortunately, um, she had a budget meeting that ran over, so that didn't pan out well. But I do want to bring her on in the future because I think she is such a fantastic resource for just telling us what we need to do to affect change. But I will encourage you to watch an interview that she did with Michael Brooks because she breaks it down you know, what's at stake and how you can win against large multinational corporations that are trying to defeat you. And shout out to Michael Brooks, by the way, who actually put me in contact with her team um, because I've followed Shama's career now for quite some time and she really is the real deal. So if you haven't heard about her, then um, change that and understand that real change is possible because this individual in one city has proven that that's the case. It's certainly not easy to affect change, but she demonstrated that it's possible and she basically showed us what you need to do to make that change happen. You rally the people and she understands that and anyone who's a true leader who understands what we need to do to accomplish change in this country understands that as well. So as many of you know, Elizabeth Warren just released a financing plan for Medicare for All, and what she manages to do is devise a plan that would fully fund Medicare for All within 10 years while not raising taxes on the middle and working class. Now, I'll just right off the bat state the obvious. This is very clearly a direct response to her critics in the Democratic Party primary who have been pressing her to explain how she's going to pay for Medicare for All. And at the last debate, she obviously didn't want to directly say she would raise taxes on lower and middle class earners in order to pay for Medicare for All. So this is what she uh, came up with. Now, while I can say that I appreciate the fact that she is reaffirming her commitment to Medicare for All, because this is real single payer, right? This isn't a diet version of Medicare for All. You know, it is a little bit frustrating because in some ways this does undermine what we've been fighting for in Medicare for All for purposes of political expediency. So I want to talk about the policy as well as the politics, because unfortunately, more often than not, politics does influence the policy. And in this instance, politics is having a relatively negative impact, arguably, on the policy itself. So let me remind you what happened when Kamala Harris, back when she was one of the frontrunners, was being criticized for her position of wanting to eliminate private insurance. Well, she capitulated, right? She came out with her own Medicare for All diet version, which actually keeps private insurance companies intact. And what she essentially proposed was a public option where private insurance can still cover essential care and there's no ban on duplicative coverage. And really, the entire plan that she proposed, it undermined why we want Medicare for all, because we care more about the delivery of health care. And in order to make sure that the goal is the delivery of good, robust, comprehensive health care, we have to decommodify healthcare. We have to get the private insurance out of it. But she didn't do that. Now, what she wanted to do was have her cake and eat it too, right? She wanted to get the critics off of her back and, you know, quell fears about what would potentially happen if she got rid of private insurance. But she also wanted to make it clear to progressives that she's with us, right? That she supports Medicare for all. But unfortunately for her, she got none of what she wanted to accomplish because at that next Democratic primary debate, as you'll remember, well, the centrists were just treating her as if she supported Medicare for all, but simultaneously she let down progressives by introducing what is effectively a public or private option. And now we're at a point where her campaign is essentially on the ropes because neither centrists or progressives take her seriously. So the reason why I'm talking about Kamala Harris is because there's a really important lesson here. The lesson is sometimes when you try to appease everyone, you end up appeasing no one. And that's exactly what happened 
to Kamala Harris. So Elizabeth Warren is kind of facing a similar situation where she needs to confirm that she does support real single-payer Medicare for all, but at the same time, she wants to quell criticisms from the center and make it seem as if she's serious and she has a way to pay for Medicare for all. But rather than planting her feet in the ground, you know, and standing strong and actually explaining her position and educating people like Bernie did, she tried to craft a plan to fully fund Medicare for all while not actually raising taxes on the middle class. Now, to her credit, she actually does manage to accomplish this, and she did find a way to finance Medicare for all in its entirety. And I'm not inherently against a plan that wouldn't raise taxes on the middle class if the system is actually sustainable and has longevity, but as always, you know, the devil is in the details. So let's look at the details here. So first of all, she correctly states that overall healthcare costs would in fact decrease under a Medicare for all system and that the total increase in federal spending will mostly be offset by savings in administrative costs and by redirecting money that we're already spending on healthcare federally, you know, uh, for CHIP, the Affordable Care Act and whatnot. That in and of itself will bring down the total increase that we need for federal spending in order to fully fund Medicare for all. And she estimates that $20.5 trillion will be what we need to raise federal spending by in order to actually pay for Medicare for all. So the question is, where does that additional $20.5 trillion come from? If you're Bernie Sanders, you know, on his proposal, he has no specific way to pay for it, but he attaches various options as to how we might be able to finance it. But he explains most of this money will come from a small payroll tax. If you make less than $29,000 per year, you're not going to see that payroll tax. But if you make more than that, then yes, you will see a small payroll tax. And as your uh, income increases, so too will that payroll tax. But disproportionately, the rich will be financing the system. And Bernie always explains that even if you're paying more in taxes, you're going to be paying less overall when it comes to healthcare costs, because he's eliminating your monthly health insurance premium. You're not going to be paying for co-pays and deductibles. So it's really important that we explain the details here. But Elizabeth Warren, she argues that you don't need to raise taxes on the middle class by one penny to finance Medicare for all. That's a direct quote. So she had the chance to explain her position, explain what Medicare for all does as we all understand it. We increase taxes, but cut costs overall, right? People will net save money. So, you know, she was faced with a similar situation as Kamala was, and she chose to not plant her feet in the ground. But the way that she tried to appease critics and really also appease people who support Medicare for All is a lot more clever, it's a lot more strategic than Kamala. Because what Elizabeth Warren actually proposes is real single-payer Medicare for All, unlike Kamala Harris, and Elizabeth Warren is essentially supporting Bernie's bill, which does in fact get rid of private insurance, which does matter, and she manages to finance it in its entirety. But how does she do that? Well, there's a number of ways, many ways that I think are actually fully feasible. Uh, she wants to crack down on tax evasion and fraud. That alone will produce an extra $2.3 trillion in revenue with a financial transaction tax on Wall Street and fees on big banks that engage in risky behavior along with changes in the tax code to make sure that corporations actually pay their fair share. A minimum tax on foreign earnings on large multinational corporations of 35% by increasing her wealth tax from 2 to 6 Six cents by taxing capital gains. Now, here's what I really like. She wants to cut defense spending in part by eliminating the Overseas Contingency Operation Fund. Now, on top of that, she wants to do immigration reform, which will net an additional $400 billion over 10 years in federal revenue, according to the Congressional Budget Office. And last but certainly not least, perhaps most important, as she puts it, She's going to pay for this by asking employers to pay a little less than what they are already projected to pay for health care. We can get almost halfway to where we need to go to cover the cost of my Medicare for all plan by doing this. Now, when you add all of those things together, she goes into great detail in her plan. You get roughly 20.5 trillion dollars overall. But there's a couple of things that I don't understand why she included. So immigration reform in and of itself is incredibly important. But you need to decouple that from Medicare for All because what you're doing is you're essentially telling us that in order to get Medicare for All passed, we have to take on two 
monumental political battles, which will be very difficult. And if you really want that extra $400 billion in revenue, all you've got to do is tick up that wealth tax by another percentage point and you make up for it. So I don't necessarily think that this is the smartest way in that regard, although Pramila Jayapal did reach out to Warren's team for clarification about this specific point, and Warren did say that immigration reform is just one option, and that really what she's proposing is a menu of things we can do to in fact fully fund Medicare for all without raising taxes on the middle class. So you can definitely make the case that we do need to decouple bigger issues like immigration reform from Medicare for all. So that way we're not trying to take on too many things at once uh, because that's just, you're making it a lot more difficult. You're putting up an unnecessary political barrier. We do need to do immigration reform, but we need to tackle that separately and not try to do that while we're fighting for Medicare for all, because then we're going to have to make the case for Medicare for all and immigration reform and argue about the details with regard to Medicare for all and immigration reform, and it just gets too messy. But because she's only saying this is an option, I think that's important. And overall, this isn't my biggest issue. What I do take issue with is the fact that over and over and over again in her plan, she describes Medicare for All as a long-term goal. And to proponents of Medicare for All, this is not something that we view as a long-term goal. This is a short-term goal. This is a short-term goal that we want passed in January of 2021 and fully implemented no later than 2025, but ideally in 2023. So when you say over and over again that this is a long-term goal, I don't know what that means. And I don't really know how to take that, but given her history of being wishy-washy on the issue of Medicare for All, I can't not see this as another red flag. Will you fight for this in the short term? Well, I mean, probably not, because you're saying explicitly over and over again that this is a long-term goal. Now, on top of that, another thing that concerns me with this funding plan is what she's essentially proposing to make up for most of what she needs to get to that $20.5 trillion uh, mark is a head tax. And what that ends up doing is jeopardizing the long-term sustainability of Medicare for All with a head tax that ultimately is regressive in its implementation. And in an op-ed for Jacobin, Matt Brunig of the People's Policy Project explains the issues with the head tax. What Warren is proposing here in ordinary fiscal language is a Medicare head tax. This is a departure from the normal Medicare payroll tax proposals. The distributive difference between them is that the Medicare payroll tax charges a specific percentage of each worker's earnings, while the Medicare head tax charges a specific dollar amount per worker. To illustrate the difference, I have the following two graphs. The first one shows the difference in terms of employer side taxes paid by worker earnings level. Under the 8% employer side payroll tax, the employer taxes paid for a worker earning $15,000 per year is $1,200, while the employer taxes paid for a worker earning $200,000 per year is $16,000. Under the 9,500 employer side head tax, the employer taxes paid is $9,500 for both workers. The second graph is the same as the first, except the vertical axis is done as percent of earnings rather than dollar amounts. In this graph, the 9,500 head tax is equal to 63% of the earnings of the worker making $15,000 per year, but only equal to 5% of the earnings of the worker making $200,000 per year. For the employer side payroll tax, it is 8% for everyone. Needless to say, the Medicare payroll tax is far superior to the Medicare head tax distributively speaking. Specifically, the Medicare head tax charges middle and low income earners massively more than the Medicare payroll tax does. So what she's proposing here is a regressive tax, and she's doing this also she can argue that she's not raising taxes on middle and low income earners. But the problem with this is it's akin to a flat tax, right? The way that Republicans and Libertarians pitch a flat tax is they say it's preferable because it's more simplistic, right? Everyone pays the same rate no matter how much money you make. But the problem with that is, you know, if you're paying, hypothetically speaking, 12% of your income, if you're a minimum wage worker... 12% of your income is a lot more burdensome than 12% of a multimillionaire's income. So a progressive tax rate is preferable because as your income rises, so too should the percentage of taxes that you pay because you can afford it. So what she's doing here, she's proposing a regressive tax 
that at the end of the day, it's essentially begging to be gamed. And what she's saying here is that if you are a company that doesn't have employees, but you just have a bunch of independent contractors, you're exempt. If you are a smaller company with uh, less than 50 employees, you're also exempt. But if the Affordable Care Act taught us anything, it's that these companies are going to do whatever they can to skirt taxes. So companies like Uber and Lyft, they're just automatically exempt. They're not paying into Medicare for all. On top of that, if you are a small company and you are getting ready to hire your 51st employee, well, rather than just hiring them as an employee, you're going to make them contract independently with you. It's just it's a system that is opening itself up to exploitation. What did the Affordable Care Act mandate? It said any company who has uh, more than 50 workers, who has full-time workers, must offer health care. So what did companies do? Well, a lot of people were just demoted to part-time positions, and a lot of these full-time positions essentially were done away with. Now, for me, as someone who worked at Walmart, I know firsthand that these companies like Walmart, they're very strict about the hours you work. Because in order to be legally compliant, they have to make sure that you don't veer into full-time because they don't want to offer you health care. So even if we went a minute over our allotted time, we would be in trouble. Like three write-ups and you're fired. That's it. So I remember having to literally just leave projects in the middle of an aisle to rush to clock out to make sure that it didn't go over my time. That's what happened because they didn't want to offer me health care. They didn't want me to start getting into full time. So what do they do? They just kept me at part time. And that's another issue that Matt Brunig brings up here. Aside from it just being regressive and a regressive way to fund Medicare for all, all just because you want to be able to say, I'm not raising taxes in the middle and working class. Well, what you're doing is you're setting up a system that actually jeopardizes the long-term health of our Medicare for All system because you have to make sure that Medicare for All is fully funded. Otherwise, it's not going to work. And in the event we don't fully fund Medicare for All, what's going to happen? Well, that will lead to dissatisfaction, which will lead to cries for privatization. And maybe we start offering skimpier benefits since it's not fully funded. Maybe we start out with dental and vision, but then we start to chip away and privatize those portions of Medicare for All. And Matt Brunig explains very specifically how companies will game the system, and they will game it. He writes, separate from the distributive problems of Warren's head tax, the two exclusions also make the proposal clearly unworkable and easily gamed. All companies have to do to avoid rather large head tax charges is spin off workers into independent contractor status or spin them off into firms with less than 50 employees that they can then contract with for services. Once some employers start doing this, the average Medicare employer contribution will have to go up to keep revenue stable, which will push even more employers to restructure their labor into independent contracting or outsourcing to small firms. And at that point, the death spiral is off to the races. The genius of the payroll tax, of course, is that it is unable to be evaded like this. Every dollar of labor income, even independent contractor income, is charged the same. No restructuring can save you from it. So, I mean, this is why the details are so important. This is why we need politicians to do more than just affirm and reaffirm support for Medicare for All. If you establish a system that is implemented in a way that allows it to be gamed, that allows for exploitation, well, then you underfund it, which then leads to Republicans and corporate Democrats pointing to the failure of government-run system, and uh, they start to chip away at it. And look, here's the thing about Medicare for All. Even if we pass Bernie's version as it is, it's still going to be undermined, right? If people love it and they see the benefits of Medicare for All and we get it, there's still going to be this concerted effort to chip away at it, you know, to kind of nibble around the edges and opt for more and more privatization. So that's going to be an inevitable fact of reality that we're going to have to deal with unless we get rid of capitalism. But that's not something that is a short-term goal that's actually feasible. So we have to work within the confines of the system that we have and acknowledge that we need to design a system that is foolproof, that can't be exploited, that can't be easily gamed, that anyone who undermines it in a very direct way they're going to have to explain to their constituents what they're doing, why they're undermining this very popular Medicare for All system. So while I can admire the fact that Elizabeth Warren isn't wavering on Medicare for All and she's reconfirming her commitment to it, the details matter. How we implement this, it matters. Now, on top of that, 
Here's how she may be undermining the fight for Medicare for All. Because now, she actually did, to her credit, come up with a way, even if it may be regressive, to fully fund Medicare for All without raising taxes on the middle and working class. So now, what's going to happen? Well, people are going to point to Bernie and they're going to say, Bernie, Elizabeth Warren found a way to fully fund Medicare for All without raising taxes on the middle and working class. Why aren't you doing this? So then that will devolve into a conversation about, you know, the benefits of a payroll tax versus a head tax. And at that point, we're just putting people to sleep. I mean, it's hard enough to convey the simple fact to people that overall healthcare costs go down in spite of a payroll tax. But now we're muddying the waters even more. Also, Elizabeth Warren can appease her critics who are just going to move the goalpost anyway. So, I mean, there's a reason why she's being criticized for this in spite of her reaffirming her support for Medicare for All. And there's a reason why the man who wrote the damn bill himself had to come out and explain why this may not be the best idea. Bernie Sanders said the function of healthcare is to provide healthcare to all people, not to make $100 billion in profits for the insurance companies and the drug companies. So Elizabeth Warren and I agree on that. We do disagree on how you fund it. I think the approach that I have, in fact, will be much more progressive in terms of protecting the financial well-being of middle-income families. Sanders told ABC News he thinks Warren's plan could have a very negative impact on creating jobs because of the funds it would draw from employers. Warren's plan calls for nearly $9 trillion from employers who would pay the government a slightly smaller percentage of what they currently pay to supply their employees with health insurance. Warren's plan calls it an employer Medicare contribution. Quote, I think that that would probably have a very negative impact on creating those jobs or providing wages, increased wages and benefits for those workers, Sanders told ABC News. So I think we have a better way, which is a 7.5% payroll tax, which is far more, I think, progressive because it'll not impact employers of low-wage workers, but hit significantly employers of upper-income people. So that's what I'm looking for in an advocate for Medicare for All. That assures me that Bernie Sanders really will fight for Medicare for All, because unlike Elizabeth Warren, he's explaining the details of his plan. What Elizabeth Warren is doing is she's trying to appease critics who will never be appeased, who are never going to be on board with her version of Medicare for All, even if it's fully funded. Joe Biden has already come out to criticize this plan and the way she's funding it, saying that what she's doing here is mathematical gymnastics. So I need someone who's going to firmly plant his or her feet in the ground and not waver. But Elizabeth Warren here, even if she's confirming to us that it is single pair that she's fighting for, this is a sign of weakness. And in her own plan, again, let me reiterate here, she mentioned that this is a long-term goal multiple times. So I'm arguing about the details of her plan, but that's if we accept that she's even going to fight for it. Timothy Higginbotham, in a piece for Jacobin titled, Elizabeth Warren is Jeopardizing Our Fight for Medicare for All, he concisely explained why Bernie Sanders really is the only person we can trust on this issue. Quote, in refusing to take the bait on the bogus how do we pay for it question, Sanders remains focused on the real obstacles to victory. He takes every opportunity given to him to straightforwardly explain how Medicare for All will benefit Americans, unlike Warren, who rarely mentions it in her stump speech, while pointing his finger straight at those who have financial and power-based interests in defeating his plan. Put simply, Sanders is correct that winning Medicare for All requires a political revolution, not wonky pay-fors. With him in the White House, we have a fighting chance. With Warren, we shouldn't hold our breath. And that is exactly it. If you are on the progressive left, I've said this once, I'll say it again. This isn't even debatable. Bernie Sanders is the best option. He's the most trustworthy and reliable on healthcare, and we know this because he has said the same thing with regards to Medicare for All and single payer for 40 plus years. He's never wavered on it. So if you want Medicare for All, Bernie Sanders is our sure bet. And let me explain something. Elizabeth Warren did not release this plan for proponents of Medicare for All. She didn't release this for you and I. She released this for her critics, to get them off of her back. But rather than trying to pander to people who are never going to be on your side, rather than trying to assuage the fears of people who like to purport that any and all tax increases are always bad no matter what, you know, she could have just said, let me explain to you why, even if we raise taxes, that's an easier way to finance Medicare for all, it's more secure, but it's also still going to save people money overall. But rather than educating people, she chose 
to not do that. She pandered to the taxes are bad no matter what crowd. And I think that in the end, that's bad. So I don't really have anything else to say about this. I'm going to leave you with a message from FDR or a warning from FDR rather who warned us about people who are making this argument, the exact argument that Elizabeth Warren is now making. And let me warn the nation against the smooth evasion that says, of course we believe these things. We believe in social security. We believe in work for the unemployed. We believe in saving homes. Cross our hearts and hope to die. We believe in all these things. But we do not like the way the present administration is doing them. Just turn them over to us. We will do all of them. We will do more of them. We will do them better. And most important of all, the doing of them will not cost anybody anything. So even though it seems like most people have already discounted Joe Biden, and I'll admit it seems like he's not going to win, let me remind you all that we should never underestimate our opponents. And I say that because he's still the frontrunner. If you look at Real Clear Politics polling averages, he still is in the lead. And what you kind of see is there's a type of zigzagging effect that's happening. He's going up, he's going down. So a lot of people will look at Joe Biden's polling numbers and they'll say, okay, he's going down again. Good, we can kind of count him out. Although he's remaining relatively stable overall if you kind of zoom back and look at the overall big picture. Whereas Elizabeth Warren is currently on a downward trajectory and Bernie Sanders is rising but starting to kind of stabilize at around 17 to 18 percent on the average. So Joe Biden is still a threat and I'm not going to make a prediction. Um, I don't think he is best positioned to win, but should we count him out? Absolutely not. And if he were to win, I don't have to convince you guys. You already know that he would be a disaster. Why? Well, we have another example why he would be a disaster. So he signed the no fossil fuel money pledge, violated that. Uh, the day after he attended CNN's climate change town hall, he went to a private fundraiser with a fossil fuel executive. And now guess what he's doing? Um, he is taking unlimited sums of dark money through a super PAC that he created after his third quarter of fundraising was dismal. So the situation with Joe Biden is just, it's lose, lose, lose. If he's the nominee, I think Donald Trump gets another four years in spite of what polls say now, because Hillary Clinton was also polling about the same as Joe Biden is at this point in time in the 2016 election. In 2015, she was still doing great. But, you know, as time went on and as she spoke more, People got sick of her, and I think that people are starting to see that Joe Biden also isn't the real deal. So I want to play a clip that was released by the Sunrise Movement, which I think is an organization, one of the organizations that's just doing the most to hold politicians accountable when it comes to climate change. So they asked him, why should we trust you if you are now taking super PAC money? Why should we believe that you're taking the issue of climate change seriously if we're not going to be able to trace the dark money you're taking? His response here um, is just, I don't even know how to explain it. Just watch. is just off the charts. Look at my record, child. He called that person who asked him a very legitimate question a child. Wow. And on top of that, she cited his record when he said that because he's boasted about his record before, um, but she cited it. Iraq War, and she went on. I don't know uh, what else she said. But then he said, no, that's just not true. Like, 
Joe Biden is slowly but surely transforming into Donald Trump. He comes up with these bold, grand Trumpian lies. He denies reality. I mean, we should just all collectively see, as those participating in the Democratic Party primary, what a disaster Joe Biden would be. But nonetheless, he sits at the top of the race. He's still in first place. Now, one thing that uh, you know, came to mind when I watched this is he needs to answer the question, right? Like, we can't rely on activists to, you know, bring a camera to these events and uh, ambush them. We actually need a media who's going to do its job and hold these politicians' feet to the fire. Next time Joe Biden is on CNN, they need to ask him, how can we trust that you're going to fight for any of the policies you say you're going to fight for, if you're doing all of these private fundraisers, if you're now having a super PAC out in the open. I mean, these are questions that should be asked and we shouldn't have to rely on organizers to ask these questions at events. We should have a media that actually does its job and is adversarial and is going to broadcast his answer to these questions, very important questions, to an audience of millions, but we don't get that. So people who watch the mainstream media they don't necessarily see how bad Joe Biden is. Maybe they see the gaffes here and there. Maybe they see his poor debate performances. Maybe they know about his poor fundraising. But the fact remains that unless the media starts doing its job, then these instances where, you know, active activists ambush politicians, it's just not going to be enough. Like, this video needs to be shared far and wide. And if you're on Twitter, I would advise you to retweet that tweet from the Sunrise Movement. But again, it's not enough. Like, this individual poses a threat, an existential threat to us. Because if he's the nominee, Donald Trump gets another four years, most likely, in spite of what polls say now. Now, you can argue with me and say that the polls are more important than my opinion. Fine. But I would, I would say, you know, give it time. Give it time, because the same thing happened with Hillary Clinton. And this election isn't just about Donald Trump. Right? This is about the judiciary. Donald Trump has appointed so many federal judges that now about one in four federal judges are Donald Trump appointees. He has remade the judiciary for years to come. And if he gets a second term, he most likely gets a minimum of one more Supreme Court appointment, which means that that would be a six to three conservative split on the court. So we have to understand that we're fucking playing with fire if we nominate Joe Biden. And look, I don't think he's going to win, but I'm not going to count him out. I'm not going to underestimate my opponent because he's still polling at number one. There are still enough centrists and older people voting in the Democratic Party primary to where he could be propelled to victory in the same way that Hillary Clinton was. So if you are a young person, you need to get out and vote for Bernie Sanders. And not only that, if you truly believe in this movement, We've got to put in the time. We've got to put in the effort. I know we're tired. I know that we're working multiple jobs. I know that we're going to school. But even if we can commit to 10 to 20 phone calls for Bernie each week, um, and even if we can't do that, if we could set up recurring donations for $5 per month, that can make a difference. Like, I don't want us to kick ourselves and look back at this moment, this opportunity that we have now, where we had a second chance to elect Bernie and say we didn't do everything in our power. At least, if we lose, we'll go down knowing that we tried. We tried our hardest. So I just ask for you to do that, you know, to really think, am I doing enough to defeat Joe Biden and get Bernie Sanders elected? Um, because it's important. Bernie Sanders truly is our best bet against Donald Trump. And if he's the nominee, even though I think that nobody really is a sure bet, Bernie is our best chance against Donald Trump. And Joe Biden... You know, aside from Buttigieg, I just can't imagine a worse scenario where Donald Trump would cruise to re-election if it were Joe Biden or Pete Buttigieg. We've got to stop him. We've got to defeat him. All right, so I know that I am super late to the party in talking about this, but I will never miss an opportunity to dunk on Dave Rubin because he is a sellout, he is a conservative hack, and most importantly, he is a dangerous, dangerous fraud.
So I want to talk about his recent appearance on Tucker Carlson's show on Fox News, where he gave his theory as to why he thinks California is having an issue with uh, fires. It's because of woke people and identity politics. Take a look. Yes. The problem right now is that everything, everything from academia to public utilities to politics, everything that goes woke, that, that buys into this ridiculous progressive ideology that cares about what contractors are LGBT or how many black firemen we have or white this or Asian that, everything that goes that road eventually breaks down. It, it, it is not how freedom is supposed to operate. What is supposed to happen, Tucker, imagine if your house was on fire. Would you care what uh, the public utility or what the fire company, what contractor they brought in, what, what g uh, gender or sexuality or any of those things he or she was? I mean, it's just absolutely ridiculous. Who would care? And Nobody cares. And I truly believe that he knows that we're not actually like this. In fact, I know that he knows the left isn't actually like this. Who would actually think that? Like, do you honestly believe that anyone on the left is so unreasonable that in order to have the fire department put out a fire, they're going to say, you know what, I need that crew to be 50% women and 50% black. Like, if it's not multiracial, uh, multiple genders, if we don't have at least one gay or trans person on that crew, I don't want them to come put out the fire. Like, who believes that this is what woke people, as you call it, are about? My brain is still in recovery mode from taking in so many high-level important ideas. Like, <laughs> it's absurd, and the problem is that he is creating these caricatures of the left that are so cartoonishly absurd that he's discrediting himself. Like, I mean, if you want to attack your opponents, you have to confine that criticism within the realm of reality. Like, if I started saying, you shouldn't be a Republican because they're all into bestiality and they practice bestiality, I would discredit myself because people would realize that that's obviously not true and I'm not a serious person. So, I mean, just in terms of helping yourself and wanting people to take you seriously, don't you think he would at least know and have the self-awareness to tone it down at least a little bit so he doesn't seem like a complete dipshit? No. And what's really funny to me is Dave Rubin is one of the loudest people who always denounces identity politics, but the reason why he has a lot of money, the reason why he has influence in the conservative movement is specifically because of identity politics. Why? Because he is a gay, gay conservative. And as Dennis Prager put it, he is incredibly useful to the right-wing movement. Because what Fox News does, and what conservatives, generally speaking, do, is they like to denounce black issues, like Black Lives Matter, and gay rights and trans rights issues, but they don't want to seem overtly bigoted. So what they do is they'll bring on a black person to attack Black Lives Matter. They'll bring on a gay person to denounce gay rights and say, maybe, you know, they have gone a little bit too far extreme. Take my word because I'm gay. So that's what Dave Rubin is. He's a useful idiot to the right and he doesn't even care. He's shameless because to him, this is all about the money. Look, I think that you can see that this is very obviously a grift, like he's one of the most transparent grifters in the world, but you would think that he'd at least have some level of shame, right? Where you'd think, maybe I'm making a little bit too much of a fool out of myself, but for whatever reason, that shame meter in his head, it hasn't gone off yet, and he, j he just seemingly does not care. He has absolutely no problem throwing his community under the bus at the behest of the right. So, you know, when the right argues that Christian bakers should be able to discriminate against gay couples, Dave Rubin is there to tell you, you know what, find another baker. When his friends on the right, like Ben Shapiro, literally deny his humanity to his face and tell him that they don't think same-sex marriages are legitimate and even should be recognized legally, he's there to tell you that, you know, this is what tolerance looks like, and it's really the left who's intolerant. I mean, this is why I feel like Dave Rubin is the most loathsome sellout, because what he does is deeply dangerous, because he exploits his identity as a gay man to minimize and legitimize homophobia on the right. Rather than fighting against it, he is allowing them to continue on with their homophobic ways, and he assures them that there's nothing wrong with that, because he's gay, and he's giving you permission on behalf of all gay people. And that's deeply, deeply troubling. Think about the uh, position that he's in. 
he is a very wealthy gay person who lives in Los Angeles. So he's not going to be, you know, uh, living in Alabama anytime soon. He's not looking at the violence against trans women issue. He just is going to pontificate about things he doesn't know anything about. But most importantly, give right wing hacks permission to be homophobic by legitimizing it. It's absolutely insane, right? And I just, I don't know how he sleeps with himself at night. Like any gay political commentator, myself included, we are very well aware of the fact that if we wanted to be millionaires, we could probably easily do that and get invited on Fox News every other night just by attacking our own community and by shifting to the right and having, you know, a political awakening. But Dave Rubin doesn't have integrity. And, you know, I actually want to sleep at night. And I'm not doing this because, you know, I know that political commentary is my ticket to become a billionaire. Fuck no. I'm doing this because I deeply care about the issues, but you could just see the difference between me and any other gay political commentator. Dave Rubin, he he doesn't do this because he cares about the issues. He's doing this because he cares about the money. And currently, at this time, when the Overton window is shifted to the right, when the right has essentially taken over the uh, the internet, he knows that it's more expedient for his career if he aligns with people like Ben Shapiro and Jordan Peterson. And as a gay person, he's especially useful. If you're just another straight person, then you really have to bring something unique to the table if you want to make it in conservative politics. But as a gay person, he is uniquely positioned to really legitimize homophobia in a way that others can't. So that's why he is a rising star in the conservative movement. And it's disgusting. It's, it's loathsome. Like, honestly, Dave Rubin is a disgusting, morally reprehensible, morally bankrupt human being. And any time I have the opportunity to call him out as a gay man myself, not to overly invoke that identity, I feel like it's my responsibility to condemn him because he's absolutely disgusting. He enables homophobia. And no, needless to say, he does not speak for gay people. Not any of us. He's a horrible person, and he should not be taken seriously. And if you didn't already know that, if that wasn't already self-evident to you, then um, do better. <laughs> That's all I'll say. Do better. So while he was on the stump for Matt Bevin in Kentucky with Donald Trump, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell bragged about what the Republican Party has been able to accomplish with Donald Trump as president, specifically with respect to the federal judiciary. And I don't care if you are on the left, the center left, the center, it doesn't matter. This is something that should be of great importance to all of us because this has implications that are lasting, right? Even if we're able to successfully defeat Donald Trump in 2020, well, the way that he has remade the judiciary, that will have a lasting impact for decades to come. So this is what Mitch McConnell said. And keep in mind that what he's saying is accurate. Well, thank you, Mr. President, for making America great again. And Matt Bevin is making Kentucky great again, thanks to your help tonight. And working together, we're changing the federal courts forever. Nobody's done more to change the court system and the history of our country than Donald Trump. And Mr. President, we're going to keep on doing it. My motto is leave no vacancy behind. Now, keep in mind that what he's referring to are federal judges with lifetime appointments. So that means that even if we are successful at getting rid of Donald Trump in 2020, well, his legacy will persist through the federal judiciary. And I don't think that people really recognize the scope of this and like how many judges Donald Trump has appointed. Looking at this bar chart from Pew Research as of July of 2018, Donald Trump appointed double the amount of federal appeals court judges as Obama, Clinton, and Bush at the same point in tenure. Now, as of September of 2019, he's confirmed a total of 150 judges, again, all of which will serve lifetime appointments. And he's been so effective at remaking the federal judiciary that now one in four judges, one in four federal appeals court judges have been appointed by Donald J. Trump. 
Think about that. These are judges who are far-right extremists, likely recommended to Donald Trump by the Federalist Society. They advocate for textualism, which means that their interpretation of the Constitution is more rigid. It's more antiquated. So, in short, what that means for you and I, when it comes to civil rights, civil liberties, um, when it comes to large multinational corporations, they're going to rule against us. They're going to rule in favor of large multinational corporations. They're going to chip away at our civil rights and civil liberties. So this is potentially dev devastating. I need you to think about this. Even if we get a Bernie Sanders presidency, if Bernie Sanders is elected and we get the best case scenario, well, let's say Bernie Sanders passes Medicare for all. Trump's lackeys now in the federal courts, all of which that he appointed throughout the country, they can easily chip away at Medicare for All if we actually are successful at getting that passed, if they don't just outright overturn it. Now, we got a taste of this with the Affordable Care Act, because if you'll recall, when the ACA was initially passed, that Medicaid expansion was mandatory. States had to accept it. Although the Supreme Court upheld the ACA overall, they struck down that mandate, right? So now states can choose to opt out of the Medicaid expansion. So they can do things like that to undermine Medicare for all. And that's if they don't just outright strike it down. Again, these are far-right extremists. They don't care about the people. They don't care about objectively interpreting the Constitution. They care about making sure that oligarchy reigns supreme in America. So um, this is something that people need to be talking about and paying attention to because the implications of this are broad and this is devastating. Now, I want to play a clip of uh, MSNBC from Chris Hayes. He interviewed Senator Jeff Merkley, and he talks through the implications of this, but also he explains how Republicans have been so successful at stacking the courts. They have changed the rules in terms of how these nominees happen. There used to be the system called the blue slip uh, process, mm -hmm. which sort of granted to home state senators a kind of veto. Uh, particularly district court nominees. That's gone now. It existed under Obama and under Democratic rule. McConnell's gotten rid of it. What are the implications of that? Well, it's being left in place on circuit, uh, on district, but not on circuit. Court. I'm sorry, yes, right. And uh, But what they did is they changed the number of hours for deliberation from 30 hours to two hours so they can just put through uh, so many judges so quickly, taking away any ability to uh, create real opposition. So McConnell is uh, looking at the fact that uh, between his partnership with Trump, they've put through about 100 district judges and a quarter of the active appeal judges, which have far more decision-making ability than the Supreme Court, because the Supreme Court takes just a limited number of cases. So they are reshaping the judiciary, and they're doing it for the powerful. The whole federal society approach is let's supersize the First Amendment so the powerful can spend hundreds of millions of dollars and take control of the government by and for the privileged and powerful. This is the exact evisceration of the we the people vision of our Constitution. That's what Mitch McConnell is doing. That's what Trump is doing. It's not for ordinary Americans. It's for the rich and powerful. And we have to find a way to stop them. And that's going to be the elections next year. So I agree with most of what Jeff Merkley says. Um, it's on point. Although I disagree with his solution. Defeating Donald Trump, that's not enough. Because again, you defeat Donald Trump, well, his legacy will persist in the form of the federal judiciary. I mean, it is these lifetime appointments that he put on the courts, they're not just going to vanish if he loses office. That's not the way that this works. So you actually do need a real solution. Now, there is thankfully a solution. And the only solution that I've heard thus far that seems plausible is from Farron Cousins of Ring of Fire. And when he talked about this, he floated term limits for all federal judges. It doesn't matter which court they're on. If you are a federal judge, you no longer serve a lifetime appointment. We limit that. Now, how long you want to make that, that's debatable. But what matters is that they are not lifetime appointments. And this issue is so important that it really should be a 2020 issue, like a top 2020 issue. And if you care about getting money out of politics, you should also advocate simultaneously for term limits for all federal judges because this really is important if we truly want real structural reform in this country. So the only way that we can undo this is to pass term limits for all federal judges. Otherwise, whatever we pass, it can easily be undermined by one of Trump's goons on these federal courts. 
Um, and think about this. We're already undergoing a Lochner era when it comes to the Supreme Court. Like, let me remind you that the Lochner era was uh, when the Supreme Court was so extreme that they were striking down any and all social and economic reforms, which is why we started to talk about court packing plans to begin with, because FDR was getting tired of this Lochner court who was striking down everything. So he threatened them with the court packing plan. Well, we're already beyond that conversation. Like, we are in a Lochner era now, but it's not just the Supreme Court that we have to focus on. It's all of the federal courts, because again... What Donald Trump has done is he's been so effective at appointing all of these judges, mostly due to the help of Mitch McConnell, that now his legacy will last for decades. These are lifetime appointments. They will be dictating U.S. law um, and interpreting the Constitution for decades to come, for most of our lives. So if this isn't of the utmost concern to you, then you need to raise the salience of this issue fast. More people need to be talking about this because for Donald Trump to have appointed 25% of all federal appeals court judges, that is devastating. Anything we want, again, not to sound redundant, but anything we want passed, Medicare for all, a Green New Deal, a federal minimum wage increase, this can all be undone by these far-right Federalist Society judges that Donald Trump and Mitch McConnell are appointing. Now, you'd think that, you know, the opposition party, Democrats, would be sounding the alarm, but I mean, Chuck Schumer is part of the problem. He basically fast-tracked a lot of judges in 2018 so Democrats can get back to campaigning. But if you're not going to fight for us, then you're giving people less of a reason to support you. So the situation, it's just... All around, it's devastating because we have this situation where, you know, Republicans are incredibly effective and the opposition, Democrats, are incredibly ineffectual. And it's led to the current situation. It's unsustainable. Their rulings cannot be the law of the land for the next 20 or 30 years because, I mean, if you truly want to save the planet, if you want to ameliorate a lot of these crises that plague the American population, you know, healthcare, student loan debt, you've got to get rid of them. So, I mean, I don't know what else to say. The outlook is grim unless we do something about this, unless we actually start talking seriously about term limits for all federal judges. So we all knew that this was coming. We knew that Donald Trump would be withdrawing from the Paris Climate Accord, and now that process has officially started as of this week. Now, the problem with the Paris Climate Accord is that it wasn't substantial in and of itself, but what little progress we've made, Donald Trump's administration is now officially undoing. Now, this news comes at a time when scientists released a report about climate change that is absolutely chilling. So as Kyla Mandel of HuffPost reports, more than 11,000 scientists from 153 countries have declared a climate emergency, warning in a new report that untold human suffering is unavoidable without drastic action. The climate crisis reaches an emergency level according to the study, when business as usual, the current action being taken or not by society, corporations, and governments is not enough to match the scale of what's needed to address the situation. In order to avoid a hothouse Earth where runaway temperature increases beget further warming, the scientists call for immediate action to overhaul the way we live, from agriculture to education. Rather than piecemeal solutions, we need transformative change in the way society functions and interacts with nature, William Ripple, a professor at Oregon State University's College of Forestry, told HuffPost in an email. Ripple, one of the study's authors, called for a holistic solution that also addresses social justice issues, and honors the diversity of humans around the world. The study, which is published in the journal Bioscience by researchers from the University of Sydney, Oregon State University, the University of Cape Town, and Tufts University, and supported by thousands of other scientists' signatories, does not mince words. It opens by stating scientists have a moral obligation to clearly warn humanity of any catastrophic threat and to tell it like it is. We declare, it continues, clearly and unequivocally that planet Earth is facing a climate emergency. So ask yourself this question. After hearing about that study from 11,000 different scientists in 153 countries, have you heard the mainstream media talk about this at all? Has CNN, MSNBC, 
made a reference to it? Has Fox News even talked about it, even if they are denigrating it? I mean, this is chilling. You have 11,000 scientists saying if we don't take drastic action, we will witness untold human suffering, and there's crickets. I mean, I, I just, I don't know what to say about that. I don't know what to say. There's no sense of urgency, generally speaking. And the situation is urgent. It requires all hands on deck. It requires constant attention. It requires innovation. We need to talk about this so it's a more salient issue among the American population. But we get a study like this, and there's nothing. That, in and of itself, is chilling. Just, you know, disaggregating the details of the report, just the reaction or lack thereof, is a problem. So, I mean, I don't know how to put this, but the situation is incredibly grim. Now, what these scientists are explicitly calling for is adaptation and mitigation. We need to tackle both of these things simultaneously because we need to not just stop the temperature from increasing, but we need to acknowledge that climate change is a reality. It's here and we're going to have to live with it. So empowering ourselves with the capability to adapt it really is important if we want to survive, if we don't want this to crush us more so than it already is. And one thing that's fantastic about the Green New Deal is it does just that. It takes into account the need for mitigation and adaptation simultaneously. Because if we're going to live with climate change, and we will, we need to acknowledge that there will be an increase in diseases which will require Medicare for all. Mass migration will require housing for all. Investing in clean, renewable technology will require a federal jobs guarantee. So all of these things are needed in order to meet the full scale of the climate crisis. However, the problem is that the Green New Deal, generally speaking, is criticized because people think that all of these things like Medicare for all, a jobs guarantee, talking about social justice, they're not germane to the Green New Deal. Like if we're going to talk about climate change, let's just talk about climate change. But as the scientists in this report are saying, no, you need to have a holistic approach to climate change because this isn't just about stopping the temperature from rising, right? This is about allowing us to live with climate change because it's happening. It's a reality. So we need to acknowledge what's going to happen. We have to try to anticipate the political ramifications and the social issues that will emerge as a result of climate change and what happens. And we've got to adapt. So I see a lot of people saying, well, the Green New Deal, it's just doomed to fail because there's a bunch of poison pills in it that make it a lot more difficult to pass. But I need people to understand the Green New Deal is not one policy, right? The Green New Deal is simply a template that commits to meeting the needs of climate change mitigation and adaptation simultaneously. So I've seen some progressive people express skepticism with the Green New Deal because individuals who are corporate Democrats like Cory Booker and Amy Klobuchar, they also support the Green New Deal. But I need you to understand that that doesn't really mean anything. The Green New Deal is a blank slate. What you need to do is fill it in with the policies that you need. And it's not like you can't pass it alone and just focus on the mitigation aspect because the new deal going back to that that wasn't just one policy like it wasn't a law we didn't just pass the new deal act and everything from the new deal was suddenly law that's not the way that that worked and that's not the way that the green new deal is going to work it's a package of policies that you pass individually right it's a series of reforms that as a whole will amount to what is known as the Green New Deal, which will give us the power to not just potentially stop further climate catastrophe, but arm ourselves with the capability to adapt to what will be inevitable in 50 to 100 years, which is climate change that is potentially going to have a runaway effect and get worse. So it's a blank slate, and candidates like Bernie Sanders have done a phenomenal job at filling in the Green New Deal and what it means to them. Again, it's essentially a wish list of things needed to address the scale of the climate crisis. That's it. So if, you know, Amy Klobuchar comes out and endorses the Green New Deal, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a centrist policy. It just means that she acknowledges that essentially it's a shell right now of reforms. And we are simply acknowledging that this resolution, which the Green New Deal is a resolution, it's not a bill, 
It's saying, let's all agree at a minimum that we need to implement reforms that meet the scale of the climate crisis, right? You can commit to that, but it doesn't mean much right now. What really matters are the policies. So that's why what Bernie Sanders and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez are doing is they are making it as wide-reaching, as broad as possible, because if we're serious about actually surviving climate change, then we can't just limit what we do when it comes to climate change legislation. Like, we have to really think about this as broadly as possible, as scientists are saying, we need a holistic approach. Now, on top of that, we need to invest in new technology. Now, I'm not too educated and well-versed in carbon capture and, you know, actually taking CO2 out of the atmosphere, but we need to do things that stop that, right? Because we're, we're continuing to pump all of this CO2 into the atmosphere. That's an issue. So we need to do what we can to make sure we try to remove CO2 as much as we possibly can. You know, the one thing that comes to mind is planting a shit ton of trees. And thankfully, there's YouTubers currently who are trying to plant 20 million trees. I don't know how feasible that is, but that is something that is important. Now, the problem with that is trees eventually die and then they release the CO2 that, you know, they're holding in. So that's another story for another day. But what matters is that we take action that is absolutely, one, drastic, and two, comprehensive, and three, holistic. We've got to make sure that we're thinking of everything, trying to anticipate consequences that we don't even know about yet because we have no idea what types of apocalyptic scenarios will come to fruition with runaway climate change. So we've got to try to arm ourselves with as much as we possibly can, healthcare, education, a jobs guarantee to make sure that we survive. That's what this is about. So you can say that um, I don't think that the Green New Deal should include Medicare for all. That's fine. You can say that I don't believe the Green New Deal should have any reference to social justice at all, even though communities of color will be impacted the most. That's fine. We disagree. But understand, these are not things that are inextricably linked to the Green New Deal. They are associated with the Green New Deal and they come as part of a package of reforms that together would amount to a Green New Deal. But we need to make sure that we get the details of this right. The Green New Deal is a resolution and what matters is the policy that is going into the Green New Deal. Um, so far, Bernie Sanders has the most robust, comprehensive plan to take action. And that's why I'm with Bernie Sanders, because it's not a guarantee that Bernie Sanders gets elected and saves us. But, you know, his form of reform would give us a fighting chance. And that's all that we can hope for at this point in time. Bernie Sanders recently held a rally with Ilhan Omar in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and she made a really powerful case for Bernie Sanders, but during the course of her stump speech, Fox News took issue with one portion. Now, they're going to fearmonger about what she says, and they're going to trot out an all-too-familiar argument that they've made hundreds of times against the left, particularly Bernie Sanders and AOC. I'm sure you can predict what that is before you even hear them speak. Nonetheless, here it is. I am beyond honored and excited for a president who will fight against Western imperialism and fight for a just world. Greg, what kind of world is she thinking about? Oh, when I hear her, I just say, oh, brother. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, they were talking about, uh, I, Bernie Sanders was talking about imperialism, right? Yeah. He's yeah. talking about imperialism. So you realize it, his socialist heart isn't really in Sweden or Denmark. Mm -hmm. It's in the old Soviet bloc and Cuba. Uh, we love him as an adorable, cr uh, cranky Muppet. But his ideas are kind of destructive. And when you accuse anybody of like, oh, you don't love America, um, when they are talking about America as some kind of Western imperialistic mess, there's a valid point to be made there. And that, you, and that they can't wait to see America fundamentally changed. Well, I would say that the real Western imperialists were the French and the British, who really screwed up the entire map. If you look at the <laughs> Middle East, they're the ones that drew all those lines that we're now defending. Come on, British. <laughs> 
way to take it to the Brits. <laughs> Seriously. Oh okay, we were an imperialist nation. In the, the commercial break, I can't wait to hear any thoughts on this. Uh, I mean, people are right now in Venezuela buying gas with cigarettes. It's ridiculous. And this is why people laugh at him as eventually yeah. being the mainstream candidate. When you throw around that Western imperialist, like, it's never going to happen. And her saying it's never been further away than my in my lifetime or whatever, refugee to Congress. She's but they did have a big crowd, It just happened. Yeah. Well, I just, you know, it's funny to me. Isn't Trump the one who says America first and trying to get us out of everything? And but so, that's not changing well, that's, America. no, that we're talking about imperialism, Dana. And so it seems to me like Trump is saying, hey, you know what? I don't like this nation building stuff. I don't like the idea we get involved as the world's policemen. Huh, this sounds like the left wing version of Trump talking point. Oh, interesting. So you're saying that they're actually for Trump 2020. Well, I'm saying, <laughs> you're, you guys are sitting here, oh, oh this is so outrageous. In fact, it sounds like your guy. Yeah. <laughs> Fair point. All right. So it is evident to me that Fox News is getting incredibly lazy. Before, they used to take a little bit more time to, like, finesse their anti-Bernie arguments, but now they just go straight to the uh, Cuba-Venezuela arguments. I mean, do they honestly believe that this is effective? Like, they stopped making the Venezuela argument for a while because I think they realized that they were using it so much it was becoming a meme and the left was really making fun of them. But, you know, they're back to their same old tricks. So let's get to what they say. So when it comes to Ilhan Omar, Greg Gutfeld says, when I hear her, I say, oh, brother. Now, they all burst out into laughter. And what he was referring to, what essentially he did there, was a dog whistle to conspiracy theorists who believe that Ilhan Omar married her brother to get to the United States. Now, there is zero evidence for this theory. Nonetheless, it's something that has persisted on the right. I believe that this is something that was started by Laura Loomer. I'm not 100% sure about that, so don't quote me, but... There's no basis in reality for it, right? And they don't want to address the substance of what she's saying, so they resort to a smear that is completely and utterly baseless. Now, Greg Gutfeld goes on to say, Bernie's socialist heart isn't really in Sweden or Denmark. It's in the old Soviet bloc and Cuba. <laughs> okay. He literally provided zero evidence, and not even an argument, really, to back up that claim. What is it about what Ilhan Omar said there links Bernie Sanders to Cuba? Like, you didn't use anything to make that jump. If you really want to argue against your opponent, you need to argue based on substance, based on the merit of their claims and try not to straw man. But Fox News, all they do is straw man. And then, of course, Greg Gutfeld went on to say that it's a valid point to accuse someone of not loving America if we critique Western imperialism. So if we don't, in other words, condone 100% of what our government does, the actions that they take abroad in the Middle East and North Africa, then we're not patriotic. Would you say the same thing about people in North Korea? The way that they idolize Kim Jong-un as if he is a demigod? Don't you think that that's weird? So why can't you be introspective and realize that maybe us never questioning our own government's actions is a little culty, kind of like it's culty in North Korea. Why is it culty in North Korea, but not culty in the United States? Like, I don't get it. Like, Americans, by and large, on Fox News, they don't have any self-awareness whatsoever. And most Americans, they'll just recite the Pledge of Allegiance, not even think about it, not even think, this seems weird, this seems like indoctrination. And Fox News helps to perpetuate that. Like, on the left, we really are about challenging authority, actually questioning our structures, our political organizations. But what Greg Gutfeld inadvertently is saying is, look, you should just be a sheep. Otherwise, we're going to say that you don't love America. OK, that's not a very persuasive argument, but um, proceed to make it so you look like a fucking fool. Now, they then move on to what we all knew was coming. The part where they stopped trying to even make any sort of an argument whatsoever and they just scream the following. Venezuela. So, of course, they trotted out the good old Venezuela argument. But ask yourself, how did they go from talking about U.S. imperialism to Venezuela? Like, they completely changed the subject and tried to shoehorn Venezuela into the discussion uh, in a way that just didn't really make sense. Well, it's because these people are political hacks and they are intellectual lightweights because they don't know how to do anything but cite the same 
talking points and common themes on Fox News that they always cite. Like, they're so predictable at this point that I can predict what they're going to say before they open their fucking mouths. Like, they're going to play all the Fox News greatest hits. They're going to talk about socialism and communism and Venezuela and Cuba. And if the conversation is about climate change, then they're going to call a Democrat hypocrites for, you know, flying in airplanes. They are predictable. And all they do is straw man us. But as they continue to straw man us and take us out of context and just smear individuals like AOC and Ilhan Omar and Bernie Sanders without actually providing a persuasive argument to counter what we're saying, they are making themselves look like fools. But thankfully, Juan Williams, as usual, was the sole voice of reason on this panel. And what I love was that he came up with the counter argument that was so profound that he actually got Greg Gutfeld to concede, who's a hack, by the way, that that criticism was actually pretty fair. So the argument was, look, if you are going to accept and embrace really what Donald Trump is saying about America first and ending regime change wars, why is it that when a Democrat or someone on the left makes a similar argument but is actually sticking to it, who believes what they're saying, why are they kooky? When we talk about ending U.S. imperialism and meddling in foreign elections, why is it kooky only when we say it, but when Donald Trump says it, it's perfectly sound, it's perfectly reasonable? Well, there's an easy answer for that. It's because you guys are fucking hacks over at Fox News. And because that was such a good point, uh, Greg Gudfeld, he couldn't, he couldn't respond. Like, you can't respond to that because it's true. Now, getting to U.S. imperialism and why this is something that is so incredibly important and why every single American should be against U.S. imperialism is because if you're not, then that says a lot about your character. The United States has used its international hegemony to overthrow democratically elected governments all throughout the world, notably in Iran and Chile. And we've done this so we can install puppet dictators who will grant us unfettered access to their natural resources. We've toppled regimes in countries that didn't attack us. We've turned countries into failed states. We illegally conduct drone strikes in multiple countries that end up killing more civilians than not. We have hundreds of military bases throughout the world, and on top of that, we use our influence to prop up human rights abusers like Saudi Arabia. We act as an obstacle to ending apartheid in Israel. We turn a blind eye as India escalates tensions with Pakistan, both countries, by the way, are nuclear powers. So when we're talking about U.S. imperialism and the need to end it, we're referring to all of that. Moral atrocities that are being committed by our government, paid for with our tax dollars. And this entire U.S. imperialism that's being waged right now is being driven by a bloodthirsty military-industrial complex that Eisenhower warned us about. But as uh, Richard Wolff put it, even he couldn't have predicted just how powerful it would become one day. So what we have done in this country is we prioritize the profits of weapons manufacturers over the lives of human beings in other countries. So when we talk about U.S. imperialism, we're not just talking about ending regime change wars. We're not just talking about bringing the American troops home. We're talking about stopping everything that we are doing to destabilize the planet. That's what we're talking about. It's a moral necessity because if you care about human life, if you genuinely believe that human rights are a thing and that they should be respected, then think for yourself, Greg, and Fox News and viewers of Fox News. But of course, that's too much to ask because these are individuals who are not actually interested in political dialogue. These are people who are paid to lie. These are paid propagandists. And they're doing exactly what they are paid to do. But that's just shameless, because rather than fear-mongering about ending U.S. imperialism, if they were actually a real news outlet who challenged power and didn't just act as one of many stenographers to power, then they would actually be educating people about why we need to end U.S. imperialism. Because objectively speaking... It's morally bad. It is not cost efficient. Uh, the military industrial complex and weapons manufacturers don't actually create very many jobs. And it's something that we need to acknowledge. Like if Russia was doing this, if China was waging a war in our backyard, we would be very concerned and rightfully so. 
So we need to have a little bit of self-awareness and realize that if we wouldn't want another country to do what we're doing, maybe we should stop doing what citizens in other countries view as a net negative that destabilizes the entire world. So, I mean, I don't know what else to say about this. I'm not sure, you know, um, that I expected anything different from this. I already knew that once Ilhan Omar stumped for Bernie Sanders, Fox News was going to say something about something that she said. And, of course, I was correct. I just expected, I guess, at least a little bit more substantive argument, but it's Fox News. So, you know, they're, they're getting dumber with time, it seems. But keep it up because you're only helping us make the case against you. Well, Elizabeth Warren released her Medicare for All financing plan and political commentators are weighing in. I also released a video about it, but our friend Ben Shapiro also decided to give his take on it. And what I love about this clip that I'm going to show you is he's going to react to something that he clearly knows nothing about. And he's going to talk about numbers as if he's never seen them before because healthcare spending in the U.S., it's astronomical, right, compared to other countries. But the way that he talks about this, it's as if he's never actually looked up how much we're already spending on healthcare. So it's evident he doesn't know much about U.S. healthcare policy. In spite of that, he's still going to pontificate about a subject that he knows nothing about and proceed to make a complete and utter fool of himself. Um, and I'll admit, this was thoroughly enjoyable. Again, her Medicare for All plan is just a perfect window into the, the bizarre mind of Elizabeth Warren. According to Reason.com, Reason Magazine, her plan to finance Medicare for All at a total price tag of nearly $52 trillion, including about $20 trillion of new government spending, an estimate that is probably low. She keeps saying that she's not going to increase middle class taxes, but that's obviously false. For example, the, the chief trick that she plays when she proposes Medicare for All is that she says that the, the employee-based insurance program, so your employer ba pays in and then you pay in. Your employer pays in maybe 8%, you pay in maybe 7%, and that pays for your health care. She's just going to take all of that and turn that into a tax that goes to the federal government. That's called a tax. Now, people may say, well, it doesn't come out of my bottom line. Well, it does because, see, here's the thing. Your employer-based health care insurance is actually good. Medicare, not nearly as good. So she's just converting private expenditures into a tax and then not calling it a tax. And she refers to it as an employer Medicare contribution. Oh, it's voluntary now. Sure, that, that, that is, in fact, a tax, obviously. That was basically um, his head when he saw that $52 trillion cost. But, you know, something that he is conveniently leaving out is that the cost with Medicare for All at $52 trillion, that takes into account total healthcare spending, which includes federal, state, individual, private. But um, what he doesn't tell you is that Actually, not doing Medicare for All would cost more. It would cost more money. So Medicare for All is actually cheaper in terms of reducing total healthcare spending. But before I say that, I'll also just add that I also have my issues with the way that Elizabeth Warren funds Medicare for All. I prefer a payroll tax as opposed to her regressive head tax. With that being said, though, to say that $52 trillion is a type of shocking statistic, or he didn't say it, but I mean, it was evident in, you know, with the tone in his voice that this was somehow shocking, it goes to show you that he doesn't know what he's talking about. So I'm going to be extra kind to Ben Shapiro here, and I'm going to argue with statistics that he can't possibly disagree with. We're going to cite a conservative Koch-funded Mercatus Center study to demonstrate how much we really are paying for healthcare in this country. So I want to show you this graph from the brilliant Andrea Witte of connectthedotusa.com who shows you just how much we are projected to spend over the next 10 years. This is according to an estimate by the Mercatus Center. That is 59.7 trillion overall. If you look at the total on that left bar, it's almost 60 trillion. So this estimate that Elizabeth Warren came up with is actually low. But to the right of that, you can see that moving to Medicare for all single payer will actually reduce overall spending by about $2 trillion. So when we saw all of these headlines about how a Koch-funded study found that Medicare for all actually saves $2 trillion overall, this is what we're looking at. Overall health spending will be reduced. Now, there's a number of reasons why this will be the case, but a huge share of savings 
comes from the elimination of administrative costs. But, you know, that's kind of besides the point. What I want you to look at is federal spending, which is the yellow portion of these bars. So the federal government is already projected to spend trillions of dollars over the next 10 years on healthcare. So regardless if we do Medicare for all or not, we will be spending trillions of dollars on healthcare. Now, if we pass Medicare for all, what actually changes is the amount of federal spending versus state, private, and individual spending. So while federal spending increases, state and local and individual and private spending decreases under a Medicare for all system, while overall total healthcare savings also comes down. Now, you can argue about how long it will take for some of these savings to take effect. There's debate about that, and that's reasonable. But what isn't reasonable is for people like Ben Shapiro to not explain that $52 trillion is less in total healthcare spending than if we actually keep the status quo. So I'm going to make a prediction. Over the next week or so, since Elizabeth Warren did cite $52.5 trillion as total healthcare spending, a lot of mainstream news outlets will basically cite that as the cost for Medicare for All without telling you that not doing Medicare for All would cost more if we're looking at total healthcare spending. Because again, even if we increase federal spending, overall healthcare costs come down. Because that administrative savings, it really is important. Because if you are a hospital and you only have to bill one entity, the federal government, that's a lot easier, right? You don't have to have legal departments and individuals that you hire just to do paperwork to file, you know, these these different claims and whatnot for private insurance. You don't have to do any of that with single payer. So you save a lot of money alone just by doing Medicare for all and doing away with those administrative costs. So you're going to hear people say 52.5 trillion, but please acknowledge that what that refers to is total healthcare spending over the next 10 years and that is less with Medicare for all than if we maintained the status quo. Now Getting back to uh, Ben Shapiro's argument here, he also left us with another gem. Your employer-based healthcare insurance is actually good. Medicare, not nearly as good. You're wrong. I mean, how out of touch do you have to be to make a statement like that? You may get good uh, health insurance through your employer, but the problem with that is when you link your health insurance to your employer, your ability to maintain said health insurance will be contingent on your employment with that company. So that's an inherently unstable system and it could leave people vulnerable if they have a job change. And you could lose your insurance on a whim if your employer decides that they want to go with a different provider. So this takes the healthcare choices out of your hands because you are restricted to what your employer wants. You're restricted to the network that they want you to have. So it's not better. And when it comes to Medicare, it's largely cited as the most popular social program for a reason. But here's the thing. What Ben Shapiro isn't telling you is that before we expand Medicare to everyone, we are first going to improve it. I mean, there's a reason why the slogan that you'll see on the posters in Medicare for All protests is love it, improve it. Medicare for all, because before we expand that, we have to improve it because there's a lot of loopholes that exist in current Medicare, which require people to get supplemental coverage through private insurers that gouge them. So what we're trying to do is close all of those loopholes and expand coverage. So that way, when we actually do roll out Medicare for all and expand it to everyone, it will be comprehensive. It will actually be sustainable. But Ben Shapiro, of course, I don't even know what type of healthcare reform he's in favor of. He'd probably say, well, we just need, you know, more of the private market and less government, which is incredibly stupid. And I don't want to straw man him, but I'm assuming if he is a conservative, that's what he'd opt for, right? A more neoliberal approach to healthcare reform, because that is something that conservatives and corporate Democrats have in agreement. But the problem with a private insurance based healthcare system is you are incentivizing people being ripped off, right? If you don't take that profit motive out of the equation, if you don't decommodify healthcare, then you're not prioritizing the delivery of healthcare. You're prioritizing profits, which is why we are in the current predicament where we're at right now, where millions of people are uninsured and millions more 
are underinsured. They have insurance, but they don't realize that it's actually shitty insurance. And unfortunately, under the Affordable Care Act, premiums are continuing to increase because it actually isn't too affordable after all. Um, what is affordable is pretty subjective. So what matters is making sure that every single person, regardless of their income, has access to real health care and not just access to insurance, access to health care, meaning it's free at the point of service. And if they want to see a doctor, they just call their doctor, make an appointment and show them their Medicare card. That's it. But Ben Shapiro, what he argues for is always going to be what's best for the private sector, what's best for multinational corporations, right? So it doesn't even matter. Even if objectively speaking, a policy like Medicare for all is better to him, Big government is inherently bad. So even if we shouldn't theoretically, from a moral standpoint even, have a healthcare system that depends on the private sector, it doesn't matter what actually delivers the best public policy because he takes a default position of government bad. But unfortunately for him, that just automatically means that if you don't want government, big government will then be replaced by big business. So pick your poison. It's one or the other. I'd rather opt for big government because at least we can elect who is in control of our government to a degree, right? We may have an oligarchy. We may have special interests drowning out our voices in elections, but I don't get to elect who's on the board of Aetna or on the board of Blue Cross Blue Shield. But Ben Shapiro, he's a hack. So in the event the Republican Party came out in favor of Medicare for All, he would suddenly change his tune because that's what he does. He's playing on a team, team Republican, team conservatives, and he's going to rep their position no matter what and no matter what it is. By popular demand, I have decided to bring back the voice message segment. So a couple of years ago, we used to do this on a weekly basis where I would listen to some of your voice messages and respond accordingly. Although this time I am choosing to limit it to Patreon patrons because first of all, that is going to make it so I'm not as overwhelmed and I don't receive dozens of messages every single week. So that filter is necessary. And on top of that, I genuinely want to hear from people who support the show the most because I think that you are the most engaged with politics if you can support the show. But nonetheless, we could open this up in the future to more people. But for now, this is just going to be an extra Patreon perk where if you are a Patreon patron of The Humanist Report, you could submit a voicemail and I may listen to it on the show and respond. So this week, we have a message from Brian, aka Pi Disliker, who's going to ask us about a potential running mate for Bernie Sanders. Hey, Mike, I just wanted to get an idea of your thoughts of Pramila Jayapal potentially being Bernie's VP candidate. I know that she's been a huge advocate for Medicare for all. Someone argued that her plan is much more progressive as She's offering a two-year plan as opposed to Bernie Sanders' four-year plan. Uh, but beyond that, she advocated for the minimum wage being raised to $15 an hour in Seattle. And she endorsed him in 2016. So uh, what are your thoughts on Pramila Jayapal? Because I know that she doesn't get a lot of attention uh, with comparison to some of the other progressive activists and government officials out there. Thanks. Thank you so much for the message, Brian. Yeah, that's really a great question. And Pramila Jayapal, who was someone who I've had at the top of my list for quite some time, but unfortunately, there's one issue that would limit her from being the VP or president. Um, she was born in India. So you cannot assume the office of the presidency if you were not born in the United States. Um, so that's an issue. And I really don't like this. I think that that law or that part of the Constitution is antiquated. I think that we should update it because being American doesn't just mean that you're born in the U.S. It means that you are an American. You're here. You're living here. You're part of society. You contribute to the economy. And you can't argue that someone like Pramila Jayapal doesn't contribute to American society. So I think that that's something that should be updated, although I will say that that provision to the U.S. Constitution did prevent Arnold Schwarzenegger from becoming president because he did want to run, but he couldn't because he's not a natural born citizen. And the sad thing is that he probably would win because in America, we just worship anyone who's a celebrity. I mean, Donald Trump is president. So um, we do need to change that, especially 
you know, if we want to elect more progressives, because a lot of people who are progressive, who are in power currently, are immigrants. And I think that's something that should be celebrated. So, you know, if it weren't for that, I would definitely opt for someone like Pramila Jayapal. But um, in terms of who I would want to be Bernie's VP, my number one choice will always be Nina Turner, because what I'm looking at is someone who can carry the torch after Bernie's gone. Nina Turner is not only passionate, not only does, does she align with Bernie Sanders politically, but she's someone who is young, right? There's longevity there. She could have a long career in politics. So Nina Turner really is my best bet. And I never really thought that that was realistic because she was only a state senator. So Bernie Sanders may want to not pick her because he doesn't want to be criticized that he's choosing someone who doesn't have that much political experience. But we're at a state in American politics where we have a reality television show star as our president who has zero political experience whatsoever. We have the mayor of a small city in Indiana, Pete Buttigieg, what uh, the media declares a top-tier candidate, even though on average he's pulling at 7%. So I say, pick Nina Turner. Like, she is great, she'd fire up the base, and she absolutely is someone who unquestionably would carry on the torch. So it's going to be Nina Turner for me overall. But um, to Brian's point about Pramila Jayapal being very progressive, He's right. So her bill, even though it is intended to be a companion piece to Bernie's Medicare for All bill, her bill is better than Bernie Sanders' bill. I will admit that as a member of the Brotherhood of the Bernard, her bill's better. She also wrote the damn bill, and it's better. Now, the reason why, there's a couple of reasons, but the main reason why I like her bill better is because it has a two-year rollout as opposed to Bernie's four-year rollout. Now, this is something that I would hope Bernie would change upon, you know, um, passing the bill. Hopefully, he'd make his bill align with Jayapal's. But the reason why his bill has the four-year uh, as opposed to a two-year transition is because, for whatever reason, he allowed Kirsten Gillibrand to write that portion of the bill. And I'm assuming he did this so that way she would support it. But, I mean, if she's not going to support it, then she's going to be criticized. So we shouldn't be allowing them to write bills for us if they don't actually have our interests in mind, right? So I don't like that, and I really hope that Bernie Sanders would change that. And the reason why I think that we need to opt for two years as opposed to four years, and you could even make the case that one year is sufficient, but the reason why is because, first of all, this is a crisis, right? We need to get healthcare to people as quickly as possible. But there's also, you know, a reason as to why we need to roll it out faster. We saw how public support for the Affordable Care Act was undermined. So during that four-year period, one, Republicans could rally against it, fearmonger about it, and um, make it more difficult to protect because we already know that once it's passed and people get Medicare for All, they'd love it, but we just need them to get that. Like, we need to put it in their hands so they want to keep it. Um, so that's one argument. On top of that, during that four-year transition period, if you pass Medicare for All as it is and we have that duplicative ban, we're essentially getting rid of private insurance. So if these private insurance companies know that they've got four years left to live, what's going to happen? Well, their investors are probably going to bail and move on to the next money-making venture. They may close down earlier than expected and not stay in business for the remaining four years or three years. And what's going to happen if that is the case? Well, people would temporarily lose their health insurance. Now, of course, it's good because they're getting Medicare, so this is a short-term issue, but nonetheless, it's an issue that would create a more rocky rollout for Medicare for All than is necessary. So that's why if I see Bernie Sanders as president, I'm going to push him to fight for a two-year rollout as opposed to a four-year rollout. Now, look, I'll take either one. I'll take the four-year rollout. Hell, I'll take Elizabeth Warren's version of Medicare for All where she funds it with a regressive tax. Like, that's not ideal, right? We'd push her if she actually fought for it, which I don't think she would, but if she did, we'd push her to change it. But it's just a matter of getting politicians to align with what we want and what is the best policy. So, at the end of the day, um, Brian's question is great. Pramila Jayapal would otherwise be a fantastic VP choice because she wrote the damn bill too, and it's a phenomenal, comprehensive Medicare for All bill that I absolutely adore, um, but unfortunately, she wouldn't be able to uh, be the president, which is super disappointing because she is fantastic. 
But um, I think Nina Turner would be a solid choice to carry on the torch. And you know what? Not even a solid choice. Like the best option to be VP. So I'll admit that I do, to a degree, enjoy the horse race aspect of the Democratic Party primary process. But I do think this question of who is the worst Democrat running, it is something that we should consider because we only have a finite amount of resources and time and we have to make sure that we defeat the worst of the worst. So at the beginning of the primary process, I pretty much declared Joe Biden to be the worst because, I mean, there's a lot of reasons as to why he really is the worst. But as time has kind of gone on, I've realized that Pete Buttigieg is also really bad because not only is he being propped up by the media, but the things that he says about Medicare for all, they're actually landing. Like he, I think, single-handedly to an extent, is driving down support for Medicare for all because since he's been attacking Medicare for all, well, Medicare for all has gone down in the polls and a public option has increased in terms of public support for it. So these are people who we need to target if they are the worst, because we have to make sure that the primary is as left as it can possibly be. And there's a lot of centrists that I loathe in this race. But really, when it comes down to who's the worst, there's two options, Joe Biden and Pete Buttigieg. And I've gone back and forth. Um, and ultimately, I think I've probably landed permanently on Joe Biden. But I outsourced this thinking to my Patreon patrons because I wanted to know what you guys thought about who's the worst, and I asked, and you guys answered in large numbers. So, by a total of 48 votes, patrons of the Human Support believe that Joe Biden is the worst of all the 2020 Democrats, and in second, but a strong second, is Pete Buttigieg with 22 votes, Amy Klobuchar comes in third with 12 votes, and then John Delaney in fourth with seven votes, Kamala Harris in fifth with five votes. So you kind of see... All of the centrists, you know, unsurprisingly, being targeted by the Humanist Reports audience as the worst of the 2020 race. Now, we have Cory Booker with one vote, Bernie Sanders with zero votes, unsurprisingly, Tulsi Gabbard with two votes, Andrew Yang with four votes, Beto O'Rourke, who has since dropped out with three votes, Elizabeth Warren with two votes, Julian Castro with zero votes, billionaire Tom Steyer with two votes, Marianne Williamson with one vote, and Michael Bennett with zero votes, not necessarily because he's not a goon, but I think because he's such a non-entity. Like, he said something the other day that proves how unserious he is. So he said, rather than looking at free college, what I'm really looking at is uh, free preschool. Now, obviously, we should do both. That's the obvious answer. Why can't we have both? But I mean, preschoolers can't vote. So if you want to win an election... Well, political expediency dictates that you should go after people who will be casting votes. There's lots of college age people who will be voting. To say that you don't care about them and you care more about preschoolers when preschoolers don't have debt, I mean, it's a little tone deaf, right? But nonetheless, uh, I agree with basically the top five here. This makes a lot of sense. But ultimately, it seems like people are relatively conflicted between Joe Biden and Pete Buttigieg. But um, the comments kind of shed light on some of the patrons thinking here. So Mari Isabel says, Pete is pretty horrendous, but I'm going with Biden, who was a more obvious wrong choice for this country. I believe that either candidate would lose in a general election, but Biden, with his mental decline and backwards attitudes, couldn't be further from representing who we are as a country. Marxist curveballer with a fantastic point here says, Mayor Pete, get ready America, because every four years the mainstream media will be trying to ram this guy down our throats as a serious candidate who represents democratic values and has broad appeal in Midwestern states, seeing him explain the reasons why a public option would be financially disastrous, only to then come out a few months later with the exact opposite talking points on Medicare for All was disturbing to say the least. In all honesty, I think the South Bend Police Department scandal will be his unraveling. However, he'll still end up on MSNBC or CNN as an overpaid corporate shill spouting off nonsensical talking points about the munitiae or his emphasis on undefinable values. Side note, Buttigieg is the worst candidate of 2019, and Mnuchin is the worst word of 2019. Thanks for everything, Pete. Hunter Louise Jelf says, Amy Klobuchar's smugness makes John Delaney blush. At least she has the momentum from Bill Maher's endorsement. 1.8%! Woo! <laughs>
<laughs> Kay Smith says Biden is the worst at the moment. He should retire from public life. Tom Steyer is also awful. He used dirty tricks to develop his email list, then bought his way into the race and onto the debate stage. His only idea is we must be Trump. We never need another billionaire president. Are you listening, Michael Bloomberg? Borden says Beto was my pick. The ratio of hype to substance is so wildly off. There's no table tall enough for him to stand on to reach the presidency. Christian LaSalle says it was a tough decision between Cloud Char and Mayor Pete, but I went with Pete since he is probably the most effective in arguing against Medicare for All. His constant unchallenged lies about Medicare for All make him especially dangerous, and if by some insane twist of fate he actually wins the nomination, he would get destroyed by Trump in the general. Yeah, so these are all really fantastic points, and Christian LaSalle is actually the person who brought the Slate article to my attention that demonstrates how support for Medicare for All has declined while support for a public option has increased. And that's largely due to uh, the lying of Pete Buttigieg. So, you know, there's no question. Pete Buttigieg and Joe Biden, polling-wise, they're the biggest threats. It's still Joe Biden who sits at the top of the field. But they're still both very nefarious and they both must be defeated. So I think that, you know, I'm going to declare this for the most part. A draw? Um, no, I can't declare it a draw, actually, because Joe Biden got the most votes. So Joe Biden is the worst of the worst. But I still think that Pete Buttigieg is someone who we have to look out for. Because even though he's not doing too well polling, like I think he's sitting at 7% on average, the media is really trying to prop him up. Like they just ran a segment on CNN where they basically likened him to Obama. And he's basically the second coming of Obama is what I took away from that segment. It's just embarrassing. Like, this is a manufactured candidate who wouldn't have a leg to stand on if he wasn't being propped up entirely by the media, which is so frustrating because it demonstrates how powerful the media is. They can pick and choose uh, winners and losers. It's why, you know, I display this book because um, it's true. They manufacture consent. They are more, you know, subservient to power than... Um, state-run governments and authoritarian regimes but that is like i'm getting on a tangent joe biden's the worst that's the takeaway um yeah let me know your comments down below if you're not a participant in this poll who you believe is the worst and also i'd like some more poll ideas because i do want to continue with this trend um i think that it's it's fun and uh, i want to bring this back i think that more interactivity with the audience is not just fun but it's it's better it makes for a better podcast if i'm getting the input of people who watch it and support us the most. So I'll leave that there. So it's obviously the case that women make up more than 50%, at least 50% of the population, yet less than a quarter of them serve in Congress. And the reason why this is the case is because there are a lot more barriers that exist that prohibit women from running. And even if they do run, it's more difficult for them to get elected. So what we have is a new Justice Democrats-like organization that is designed to help women get elected so we can finally maybe inch closer towards parity in Congress. So with me to talk about a new organization called Matriarch is its founders, Namiki Konst and Javanka Beckles. So thank you both so much for coming on the program. Uh, thanks for the invitation. It's a pleasure. Thank you, Mike. Nice to see you again. Nice to see you again as well. So tell us a little bit about yourself. So I'm sure that my audience is familiar with Namiki Konst. So um, we're going to start with Javanka and then we'll head over to Namiki and get a quick update. Javanka, tell us about yourself and your affiliation with the organization. Uh, well, let's see. I am a longtime activist. I've lived in the city of Richmond for a long time and decided to uh, decided that I could make a difference uh, by by running for office. So I ran for office in 2008. Uh, let me just back it up a little bit. I'm a, I, I work for the county as a children's mental health specialist. And uh, working with children and families, I see firsthand the challenges that families have. Uh, and, and, you know, in working to increase the quality of life for the families that I work with, I realized that there was something lacking. And what was lacking was policy. Uh, and so I decided to run for office uh, to be able to make a difference and create the kinds of policies that would help my family, specifically the families that I work with in Rest County, the majority being people of color. Uh, so I ran for office in 2008, uh, lost uh, by slim margin, uh, won in 2010, was re-elected in 2014, uh, ran for assembly because again, city policy is one thing, and, and that's a good thing because we can do so much at the local level. Uh, but I realized that, all, that that there were policies that we couldn't implement 
at the local level. We needed some state policies. And so uh, I ran for off, uh, state office, state assembly uh, in 2018. Uh, we lost by, I would say, a small margin, uh, but it was a grassroots effort with very little money. Uh, and it was at that time that I realized how difficult it really is to run for a uh, higher office working full time. I worked full time. Uh, and it was very difficult for me to take off. And, you know, like my opponent, who was independently wealthy, uh, and uh, it really was a challenge. So when we started talking about it, and we keep contacting me and other women, uh, I thought this was a great idea because as working women, we, uh, particularly women of color, we really need uh, the boost and the support and the sisterhood that, that we are uh, building here. Yeah. How about you, Namiki? What have you been up to since we last right talked now. to you? <laughs> I was like, she, she just, she just covered it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, everyone. Uh, well, you know, um, I did run for office this year, as as much of us uh, who are involved in Matriarch have. I would say about fifty uh, percent of our advisory group um, of over three dozen women is made up of, of women who have run for office, been in office, uh, or are currently in office. And one thing that just became very clear as I got to know so many of these women over the past few years in, in the progressive movement is there are obstacles that are just not laid out in a serious way uh, when you go to these trainings to run for office. So if you're a woman and if you've been interested in running for office, there are maybe a thousand different trainings out there. And one of the first things that they do uh, is say, okay, open up your Rolodex. And you're going to call every single person you know, and we want you to raise money. That might work for, for some people. Maybe it'll work up to a month. <laughs> but <laughs> for the most part, you know, unless you are independently wealthy or of, of means or have access to wealth, it is extremely hard to raise the amount of money you need to have a, a functioning campaign um, that can last, you know, several months. I ran in a special election. If I... If that special election had gone maybe one more month, I wouldn't have a home. And I'm being completely yeah. honest. Um, right. Most right. people have to balance jobs. You know, maybe they are single parents. Maybe there's a two-parent household and, and the other uh, parent has to take on or the partner has to take on uh, the, the extra burden. There's child care costs. There's rental costs. There's debt. And a couple of years ago, when Donald Trump was elected, we saw a record number of women being called to run for office and they stepped up courageously and did so but very quickly we saw the infrastructure was not there to support uh everyday women in running because it's not just that it's hard to raise the money uh the organizations the institutions that are out there right now um for the most part are not recognizing their candidacy as as quote viable that's the word that they use yeah. um, for endorsement yeah. or support until they've raised like 150, 200, sometimes $300,000. And if you're not independently wealthy, I mean, it's even a struggle, a real struggle to get to $50,000. Yes. And the press won't pay attention to you also if you haven't raised a certain amount of money. So if you want to crowdsource, maybe you're not famous. Maybe you're you know, a community activist. Maybe you're a nurse, you're a teacher, a mom. I mean, there's so many different <laughs> professions, obviously, that don't get recognized. So. Uh, we wanted to fill that gap. Um, so for the last, you know, several months, I've been working with this this incredible crew of women to come up with ways where we can help solve a lot of the the infrastructure issues that women face when they're running um, for office, but specifically for uh, Congress for right now. And I really like that. When when I first learned about Matriarch, my thought was. Finally, because this is a working class version of Emily's List, essentially, where it helps working women, anti-establishment people who don't have that financial backing, uh, get elected to Congress. And there's already enough barriers if you choose to run, like political science studies show that women, generally speaking, in comparison with men, they don't feel as if they're qualified, which is untrue. And thankfully, it seems like we're kind of breaking away from that stigma after the 2018 election when so many women across the country are running. But when you decide to run, it is incredibly difficult. It is self-sacrifice. And you need these types of organizations to back you up. Of course, you can do it alone, but it's a lot more difficult. So what this organization to me seems like is a Justice Democrats type of organization where we're saying, look, we're taking on the establishment and we're addressing the specific barriers that exist that prohibit women from actually being electorally viable and successful. 
And we absolutely need that because this descriptive representation is incredibly important. Like I cited the statistic about less than a quarter of women being in Congress. But when you um, when you actually look at women of color, it's 8.7 percent, which is abysmal. We need these voices in Congress. We need their perspectives in Congress. And there is this difference between descriptive and substantive representation, but more often than not, descriptive representation, just getting people in Congress that are representative of, you know, the public, demographically speaking, it leads to a substantive representation, real change. So that's why this organization is so important. So I wanted to ask you, Javanka, in terms of what the short-term goal is for 2020 and 2022. Um, how many women thus far, because you guys just launched, have basically answered the call because you can nominate a woman to run. Um, do you guys know just preliminary um, results as to what the response is? Because I find this incredibly fascinating and exciting. So what's the response been? Well, it's my understanding from the, you know, the uh, uh, co coordination that uh, the collaboration that we're currently undergoing there it's been a really um high number of women who are responding uh either via through social media directly through us and so i feel like that's really exciting that that women are feeling that okay finally there's an organization that's really there to help us as working women um that uh, you know grassroots candidates uh, working people, Namki mentioned earlier, uh, nurses and teachers, and you know myself as a as a mental health specialist. I mean, we have so many professional women that are 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 in the trenches every single day, and and what better voice to represent us, right, as as working people than than us? Uh, so I know that there has been. I I don't have the numbers uh, in front of me, but I know that we've had uh, overwhelming responses to uh, to the call sort of a, a for action. Um, maybe Nomaki, you might be able to, to fill that in in terms of the, the actual numbers. Um, I don't have the number as, as of the moment, but yeah. I would say that it's it's coming in. I mean, every single time we check the monitor, it's like, oh, another one just came in. And what's incredible to see is the, the number of women who've been nominated by several people, sometimes into the dozens uh, from across the country, but especially from their communities. Um, it doesn't mean that it's exclusive. It just, it, I, you know, we know that that community support is super important. But it's it's so amazing to see um, people around the country looking at races that may not, you know, be even close to them, but they're very curious about what happens in Texas, what happens when Kentucky goes blue, where Virginia goes blue, and they're investing in a national partnership, a progressive coalition, and um, and we're we're excited to be able to help facilitate that. Yeah, and I was going to say that I really see that you know we have a we have a movement, uh, and then we have some some amazing I think super women that that are leading the way thus far in in Ilhan and and you know Alexandria and and women are seeing that yes I'm an ordinary woman I can do this I know what the issues are shouldn't I be in a position to be able to create the kinds of policies to help us uh, through these issues and that help us to have a place at the table, a seat at the table. Um, so this is this is really exciting and, and I'm really so honored to be able to be a part of this amazing movement. Yeah, to me, this feels like a paradigm shift where before women were essentially shut out from politics unless they were wealthy, right? If, you, if you're wealthy, right. you can do pretty much anything. But if you're a working class woman who we want right. to represent us the most because there are mostly normal working class people in this country, <laughs> then, you know, right. we need you to run. But there's so many obstacles that make it so difficult. So this it does feel like a paradigm shift in terms of more women getting involved and just, uh, you know, women really becoming the face of the progressive movement. I mean, you, you stated yeah. it, Ilhan Omar, um, we have uh, Rashida Tlaib, uh, AOC, yeah. I mean, Pramila Jayapal, mm -hmm. there's so many women who are now the face of the, move, of the movement. And now I think that that really sends a message to ordinary women who are just working women that, you know, I can do this as well because there are other role model, models who are leading the charge. So I think mm -hmm. that this is really nice to see, like so many people rally a around this one cause from different demographics and it's about damn time. So I wanted to ask you because this is a, a pack. So I want you to dis dis distinguish between a pack <laughs> and a super pack just so there's no confusion. Namiki, can you settle this for us? Because I saw a couple of tweets at the beginning when I when I kind of, I put out a tweet in support of Matriarch and you know, one of the first things I saw was, uh oh, this is a pack. Um, explain <laughs> what this is. 
yeah, so I'm not an elections attorney, so please don't quote <laughs> that, okay? But from, 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 <laughs> disclaimer, but that's a low. My father would probably want me to be an elections attorney. <laughs> um, so, you know, there, there are not a lot of ways that groups can come together and facilitate assistance to candidates. And that's just based on the legal structure that we live in. Um, I think we've made the case very clear as to why it's important to have organizations out there that can help candidates out. Um, I know from my experience, it was extremely hard running when, you know, nobody thought we had a chance. Um, yes. We had to raise a certain amount of money. And thank God for shows like yours, Mike, because you believed in us. And that really, your, your viewers helped get us to that level of where we needed to raise money. But not every candidate has access to Mike. Um, I was very grateful to. And so it's important to have organizations out there that can help at critical stages. So a PAC versus a super PAC. A super PAC is, you know, some billionaire can dump in his life savings and basically buy ads on TV. And, you know, and it's we saw Joe Biden is going to be a, a billionaire, maybe a few billionaires are going to be doing that for Joe Biden in his presidential race so that, you know, Joe Biden has limited campaign contributions that he can take as a presidential candidate, they're still extremely high, but they're limited. And so he's he's been unable to raise the, the amount of money he needs uh, to be viable. So, you know, maybe a few of his donors that have a lot of money and had maxed out can now put it into a super PAC and make up the difference and buy pro Joe Biden ads or maybe attack ads on other people. So that's the facility of the super PAC. It's also, you could put corporate money in there if you want to. A PAC is, is very limited. Um, the money you can receive is up to $5,000 and give is $5,000, a split into primary cycle versus general. So we want to be able to invest in candidates at a critical point where, um, you know, they, they need it. <laughs> when, when no one wants to give them money or attention, but we know we believe in them, we see their path, whether it's to victory or to changing things on the ground in their community to be in, you know, because candidates can, can serve a lot of, 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 of purposes, right? They can be running to make a statement. They can be running, uh, you know, thinking maybe they don't have a chance this time, but the next time they will, because you know, much of this country has not been invested in by progressives or Democrats for, for 25 years. Or they could be running because they have a real path to victory. And so we want to invest in a candidate uh, that we believe in and um, and offer other resources. I mean, Javanka is one of our extraordinary women in our sisterhood that is opening up their time and energy into supporting and having the backs of these candidates. And so we, we don't have our slate of candidates yet, but uh, once we do, we're based on contributions, of course, we're going to be offering assistance um, in so many different ways. And that's something a super PAC doesn't do. Uh, that, you know, hopefully down the line we'll be doing other um, educational, you know, trainings. But uh, 2020 is underway, so we're we're just trying to get as much done in this short period of time that we can to help candidates out that might be facing primaries earlier rather than later. Yeah, I hope that answers the question. No, that's that does that totally answers the question. The takeaway for viewers essentially is that this is not a dark money group. Like this is a grassroots Absolutely. organization, Absolutely. and I'm going to put a link on the screen and really highly encourage you to donate because these organizations, like even though we all hate money in politics, you know. The problem is that it's a necessity if we do want to win. And if you want to empower matriarch, to empower grassroots women, then they do need that money. And so even if you can chip in a dollar, you know, at a minimum, or, you know, find out a way to support it, you know, otherwise, uh, that really does matter. It is important. This is basically a nationwide movement. Um, I don't view matriarch as like just one component, one thing. Like I view them as a microcosm of a bigger issue, as one part of our whole movement, you know, this labor movement, the women's rights movement. This is all just one collection. We're all in this together, basically, is what I'm trying to say in a convoluted way. So they need money. So if you could donate anything to them, that would be incredibly, incredibly helpful because these organizations, they really need a boost of money, especially at the beginning, like Justice Democrats, they had TYT and Secular Talk to really help right. boost their name. So we need to do this for Matriarch because this is important. This is a cause that really matters. And if we want to make sure that we up our chances of winning elections across the country, then we need as many organizations as possible. And this is an organization that is needed, that's much overdue, and they need your help. So I wanted to ask you guys, this is kind of a generic question, but I do think it's important because a lot of people, they just kind of feel as if, 
they're overly cynical. I can kind of, you know, uh, sympathize with that viewpoint. And if you're a woman in this country, you, you kind of see the trajectory that we're on, right? You know, women's rights issues kind of is put on the back burner. We have Donald Trump in president who's incredibly misogynistic. So if you're a working woman, uh, what is your message to them? And why do you think that they should run for Congress in spite of what they might think personally? Right. Well, because our, our women's issues are, you know, is intersectional, right? We, we, you know, we are black, we are queer, we are immigrants, we are mothers, sisters, right? It's a, you know, our issues uh, uh, are intersectional and no matter, you know, where we come from, what our background, maybe even our passion, as long as we have the, as long as we have the passion uh, and support, because there's no way I could have even ran a successful uh, assembly race without so much support, without the grassroots um, passion that comes along with that and knocking on doors. So no matter you know where where you come from, uh, as long as you recognize that problem in society, um, that there is injustice, particularly as women and women of color, you know we experience injustice every single day, and so we recognize it, we see it firsthand, we look at it in the eye, uh, and so knowing that. Knowing what the solutions are, policy, creating the kinds of policies. We are not getting the policies that we need uh, from men, <laughs> and we're not getting it from white men. Um, and so we have to look to each other, right, for those uh, for the for the change that we we want to create. So I say it is a scary thing. Uh, our lives change when we run for office, and and having to do it full time is really what helps it helps us to be successful. Um, but, you know, but but do it and go for it and, and you will not be alone. And that's what's so powerful and, and, and beautiful about this organization is that we are a sisterhood. We, we, we recognize the challenges uh, and we, we've got your back. You know, the message is that you're worthy. Like what I try okay. to tell people is that you are qualified to run for Congress if you care about yes. political issues. Because think exactly. about some of the people who are serving. Like we have Louis Gohmert as a sitting member of Congress. If he can do it. <laughs> Anyone can do it. You are qualified. So I like to use that as an example to put it into perspective because we need you. Like representation is so crucial. Javanka made such a good point about the policies that are being passed because there's a 2014 Princeton University study by Drs. Gillens and Page that I like to cite that, you know, when it comes to policy outcomes, average citizens, they have zero impact. It's statistically insignificant, but elites and special interests, they actually do have a substantial impact. So we're getting policies passed that benefit rich people and rich people disproportionately are white dudes. So if right. we want to change that, we have to start changing the structures. And that means we increase representation for women. It's absolutely Absolutely crucial. So, um, Namiki, any lasting thoughts that you want to leave us with? And I want to give you both the opportunity to make the last pitch to donate because this is incredibly important. This is a grassroots movement and money is needed in order to get these types of organizations off the ground because that money, it's not just going to matriarch. What, what you do is you train candidates, you help them, you give them money. And this really helps. Like Justice Democrats was incredibly instrumental in electing AOC. And we want lots of mm -hmm. AOCs. We want mm -hmm. to broaden the squad. So we want Chibankas. Absolutely. We need more people to get in power in Congress and represent us. And like we see how AOC and Ilhan Omar, for example, are doing such a great job nationally speaking. So if we broaden that, I mean, think of the change that we, we really could accomplish. So Namiki, what's the last pitch that you want to make? And any lasting words from uh, both of you? Yeah, just some lasting words in terms of um, the electability factor. You know, there there has been a movement over the last, you know, 70 years, but really the last, you know, 40 years in particular to uh, elect women to reach parity in Congress. What that means is a little bit, you know, so we have equal representation in Congress. And we've had a couple of really great years in which, uh, one of which was 2018, where record number of women were elected. And and, you know, there was one, I think, in 1992 and then in 2006. But one thing to keep in mind there is that, um, yes, record number of women ran because they were fed up with the system. They were fed up with Republicans who had really betrayed the country, whether it was, uh, you know, Bush senior or it was Republicans during the war um, in Iraq. And of course, you know, in 2018, it was post Trump. But we have to think beyond those moments, beyond the like critical mass, horrible Republican yeah. moments. We have to think, what does it mean to build an infrastructure so we reach parity? And I think what's unique about Matriarch is 
we have a platform that is intersectional. It's a platform based on economic justice, the Green New Deal, yes. taking no corporate money and, and, and supporting candidates that don't take corporate money. Um, looking at reproductive rights as reproductive justice issues, uh, criminal justice reform, I and mean, all of the, the progressive movement issues in, in, the, in the best form possible. Um, with the root of no corporate money, because we think that you know if you, you take corporate money, um, it'll it trickles up from there, and then it's that old parable about a a, a frog being boiled in a in a pot, and of course we know that parable. Mm. So if we're electing and looking for women who come from working backgrounds and can relate to these issues personally, firsthand, then they have that special connection with their communities. They know the, the issues that their communities face. They take those issues that they face firsthand or, or closely into Congress. And then as we see with the squad and Pramila Jayapal and Barbara Lee, I mean, there's so many women throughout history who have been elected and, and defied the obstacles that took that energy into Congress. Now imagine equal representation with women like that. We think they're more electable. Um, we think that they just, you know, they need infrastructure support. They need uh, other women and other and men, of course, like yourself, having their backs, but they need that support the way that the centrists support their their millionaires and billionaires. We got to do the same thing for our movement. And I think the ecosystem is is growing and we're just another uh, piece of that. So please, if you can, uh, chip in some bucks. As, as Mike said, it's supporting everything from um, our incredible team that's going to be providing resources to candidates, whether it's mentorship from our board of advisory or uh, trainings or you know, we have some fun things in store that I don't want to, I don't want to unveil yet. Uh, and of course, you know, financial assistance uh, is important as well. So thank you. Yeah. Any lasting words from you, Javanka? I just say thank you. Well, uh, well said, Nomiki. Um, just you know that it, it it takes all of us, right? And 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 all it takes is just a little bit of either our time or our resources. And you know, the sum of that um, is is really you know what would what's going to help um help this movement and so any little bit of of money any bit any little bit of any of your resources um we would appreciate uh because we're only going to continue to get the kinds of policies that uh that increase the wealth of the elite class um if we keep electing white men um so in order for us to have the policies uh that really benefits us all uh, we need women who understand the struggles and the challenges that we face. So uh, thank you for, for having us on the show. And, and, those, and those of you who are viewing, thank you for supporting this organization. We can't do it without you. And the women that are running definitely can't do it without you. So, without you. so thank you in advance for all of the support that you're bringing. And thank you both for coming on to Mickey Kahn's Javanka Beckles. Um, the website is matriarchpack.com. Let me just make my pitch for you all because I think that it's important that I always try to put this into perspective for people. When you donate, this is kind of like an investment. Like you're putting in money into an organization that will yeah. later essentially pay you back. Like I always use the, and I, I people criticize me because I use Very this nice. example every time, but it's really important to me. So Ilhan Omar, she's not my representative. She lives, you know, in a different state. But she introduced a bill that would cancel all student loan debt. That's pretty important to me personally, right? Yeah. So when we donate to these candidates, even if they are not our representatives, that still is beneficial. So by donating to Matriarch, you are donating to an organization that is going to help push the envelope further in, ter in terms of um, getting representation for women and getting policies passed that impact every single person, namely working people and working women. So thank you both for coming on and making the case. I'm Thanks. incredibly excited. We will be following and I'm, I'm looking forward to the uh, candidate list. Thank you, Mike. All right. Thank you so much, Mike. My name is Russ Rincioni. This video is not for the establishment. I'm a progressive Democrat running for Congress. As a working class American, I waited tables to put myself through college. Now I'm a public servant. And as a government housing attorney, I fight for what I believe in. Two years ago, my son was born. My life was changed forever. I promised him that I would do whatever it takes to build a better future. But our future is at stake. By 2035, New Jersey homes will be underwater. We'll lose billions in property value. Heat waves, drought, mass extinctions, tornadoes, 
The climate crisis is here. The way forward is to invest in our future. We can create millions of high paying jobs to usher in a modern age of renewable technology, rebuild our infrastructure, and create the greatest middle class America has ever seen with the Green New Deal. I believe Americans should have the right to breathe clean air, drink pure water, and to enjoy a healthy environment. Most Americans live paycheck to paycheck. We work longer hours, but our wages stay the same. The cost of health care keeps rising, but covers less. Millions of people have no health insurance, and every year people die because they can't afford it. That's why I support Medicare for All, because it will save money and save lives. Running for Congress wasn't in my plan. When our representatives said no to the Green New Deal and no to Medicare for All, that's when I knew now is the time to fight. Politicians that take big money from oil and gas lobbyists will never solve the climate crisis. Politicians that take big money from health insurance and pharma lobbies will never give us Medicare for all. We win when we elect people that reject big money. That's why I've pledged to take no fossil fuel, corporate PAC, or lobbyist money, to stay true to working class Americans. We must eliminate corruption in politics. And we won't stop there. We can have opportunity for all with free public college and student loan debt cancellation. And we can have a federal jobs guarantee with a living wage. We can invest in our families with universal child care and paid family leave. New Jersey deserves a leader who puts our working class families first. My name is Russ Serencioni and I'm fighting for justice. Together, we will create an America that works for all of us. Hello, everyone. I'm here with Russ Cirincione running in New Jersey's 6th Congressional District against Frank Pallone, an infamous corporate Democrat who is known as the enforcer for Nancy Pelosi. And he's here to tell us why Frank Pallone's got to go and why he would actually be a voice of change in the Democratic Party. Russ, thank you so much for coming on the program. It's my pleasure, Mike. Thanks for having me. I love your show. So this is really surreal for me being here. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you so much. That means so much. Well, look, I've been following your campaign for a while, and I am thoroughly impressed. You pretty much check all of the boxes. You say Medicare for all, but you specify single payer Medicare for all. <laughs> no type of, you know, compromise, Medicare choice, Medicare for all who wants it. It's Medicare for all single payer. You're talking about the Green New Deal, student loan debt cancellation. And you are someone who you've kind of been in the trenches fighting for quite some time. You're a government housing attorney, so you're fighting against yes. basically landlords who are taking advantage of tenants, and now you're running for Congress. So what made you want to run? Well, uh, a lot of things, but most importantly, in February when the Green New Deal was announced uh, as the House resolution, uh, you know, for most, of, for most of our generation, we're very concerned with the climate crisis, and the Green New Deal really gives us hope. We can get, uh, we can clean up our environment, and transition to renewable energy because that's what we have to do based on the UN reports. And um, as soon as it came out, my representative said things like it's not politically possible. It's not technologically possible. And in my mind, that is the most absurd statement I've ever heard because we have the technology and also we have the, uh, we have the research and development and works that we could fully go 100% renewable by 2030. We could do it uh, as soon as possible. And what, when he said that, it just became very frustrating for me because I have a two-year-old son and my son's future is shaped by how we deal with the climate crisis today. His, his life in 10 years is going to be, is directly related by what we do today. If we can't end the fossil fuel age and switch and clean up our environment, I, I just don't want him to be uh, f faced with dystopia. So at the time, Frank Pallone said no to the Green New Deal. He became one of the biggest threats to my family. And then uh, the, the final nail in the coffin, really, in June, a fossil fuel company uh, tried to put a pipeline through our township in New Jersey and Old Bridge, uh, a fracked gas, uh, natural gas pipeline that would cut through Jersey, provide no economic benefit, and go to the Raritan Bay, disrupt the wildlife. They tried to put it within a few miles of my house. And that was the final straw. The fossil fuel company came after my family came after my son's, the air that my son breathes, threatened him with asthma, threatened him with lung conditions. And at that very moment, I decided that there's nothing that can stop me 
from doing everything I can to switch to renewable energy, to fight for the Green New Deal, to fight for my son's future. And that's really the main reason I'm in this, because uh, my son's everything to me and my wife, you know. Uh, also, I'm really upset with how corrupt politics is, you know, how the big money dominates everything in our elections. Uh, you know, the, the billionaires uh, really influence our elections so much that we become an uh, oligarchy, right, where our Congress only responds to the donors, and a popular opinion has very little effect on what actually gets done in Congress. So that's really upsetting to me because, you know, as you mentioned, I'm a government attorney. So I fight for housing justice. We have ethical rules of loyalty to the state agency that we work for. I want to bring these ethical rules of loyalty to the people in New Jersey's 6th District and in our entire Congress. So that's what I'll be fighting for as well, anti-corruption provisions um, and we'll be calling out every single politician that does take money from the billionaires and the corporate PACs and the lobbyists. So we take no corporate cash because we can only control what I do right now. Uh, and in the future, hopefully we'll see a corruption-free government. Yeah, well, thankfully, candidates like you, you're really trying to set a new standard for the way that you run campaigns. And even if you disadvantage yourself, in a sense, by not taking that corporate PAC money, you really demonstrate to people that you're going to remain principled. You're not going to sell out. You're not going to accept money from fossil fuel industries that have a financial interest in ruining the planet, ruining, you know, your own hometown. So I think it's really important. And one thing that I noticed about you is you really do put this strong emphasis on getting money out of politics, which is something that we need to talk more about. I mean, we're always focused on the issues, but the root cause to pretty much everything, like all the issues is the commodification of the electoral process, like money and politics. It's making every other mm -hmm. issue that much more difficult to have some type of political solution because everyone takes money from the industry. So they're too afraid to stand up to that industry. And even if you're not necessarily corrupted by an industry in Congress, you know that they can oppose you by bankrolling a future opponent. So nobody's brave enough to really stand up. So it's really important that candidates such as yourself run for Congress. And that's what you're doing. So I wanted you to talk a little bit about your experience uh, fighting for tenant rights, because you shared a couple of really interesting anecdotes on your website about what you went through and who you represented. And I found it absolutely not just fascinating, but really wild because it just really goes to show you how important tenant rights are and why we really need to be talking, I think, more clearly about housing for all. So can you share a couple of personal stories? So I spent a lot of time, I, I spent a lot of time in housing court and, you know, when tenants, uh, tenants' homes are on the line, uh, it's, it's just a psychologically damaging thing to tenants. And, I, you know, I've seen a lot of tenants being uh, frustrated. And, like, usually when somebody has a problem with, with their housing, it's because of some, some other economic problem, right? So, like, they lose their job sometimes, um, and th then they can't pay rent. So I, I don't see uh, how – I, I want to see more housing justice in our entire country. I, I want to see uh, broader tenants' protections for even – uh, especially people in the Midwest that have very few tenant protections. Uh, New York City is actually very good uh, with protecting its tenants. And um, my experience is with enforcing the rent stabilization law. That's what our agency does. We, uh, we, stay, we try to keep a affordable housing stock. Uh, there's about one and a half million apartments that are subject to the law. And uh, so I guess a, per a couple of personal stories. Um, so we deal with harassment issues when a landlord will, will harass a tenant. And with the particular story that I talk about on the website is um, a landlord was allowing a dog to run free in the hallways. And the tenant, the tenant was actually, uh, you know, attacked by the dog, like chased into her apartment. And she complained about the situation. And instead of fixing, you know, like keeping the dog in the house or, or in the apartment, the landlord just uh, retaliated against the tenant, which makes no sense. Like all he had to do was keep the dog uh, in, in his home instead of running free in the apartment building. And um, he showed up, he knocked up, he knocked her door and he showed up right in front of her and he threatened her life. He threatened to kill her. He actually shoved a pistol in her face and said, how dare you, uh, you know, complain about this condition. And so what we did, we, we call, the police got involved and we, uh, we, we made sure that the tenant had the proper protections against this landlord. Uh, so yeah, so we remedied the situation by, um, by, by getting like help there to get restraining orders and also, uh, you know, 
enforcing the, the rent law. So uh, we reduced her rent for a while as well because she had to deal with these psychological damages. But really what, what the entire goal of a housing program in our country should be uh, protecting affordable housing. We need to overturn the, uh, the draconian rules that are in place now that doesn't allow the federal government to invest in construction of new affordable housing. Uh, and instead of just repairing this really outdated housing stock, we have to start investing in affordable housing, actually doing the work and building it. Uh, so that's that's what's central to our plat- my platform as well. If we want to end homelessness, we can. We really can. Uh, and we can do it by building affordable housing for everybody. I'm really glad that you shared that because you, I think, better than most people know about that power imbalance between landlords and tenants. And, you know, we need to make sure that we are empowering people and we're talking about housing for all. And I'm so glad that so many candidates running in 2020 are actually bringing up this issue, elevating it. And Bernie Sanders, thankfully, uh, released a phenomenal plan that is a housing for all plan that could potentially end homelessness. So it's really nice to really see this issue take front and center in the election. And it's so important. But I mean, it's not it's not the only issue that you're running on. You have a pretty robust platform. And what's really remarkable to me is that so many candidates running for Congress, they're platforms are more comprehensive than most presidential candidates which is mind-blowing but it kind of just goes to show that like you guys running for congress you care more about policy than most politicians who are just career-minded you know who want to who want to advance their own career so talk about some of the other things that are at the top of your list in terms of what you think you'd be able to to accomplish or what you'd fight for in that first year in the event you're elected so we, we went over Medicare for all single payer uh, in New Jersey. We pay the fifth highest in the country for our health insurance. It'll save the average uh, New Jerseyan around $3,000 a year. Um, you know, the Green New Deal is the top part of our platform uh, because we have to beat the climate crisis. Like we have enemies at our doorsteps trying to invade and destroy our homes. Um, and the anti-corruption provisions, which an American Anti-Corruption Act, which could be passed through Congress and actually uh, end, the, end the stranglehold of lobbyists. Uh, I, want to, I want to end hunger. We can end hunger by feeding people. I want to create thousands of indoor uh, hydroponic uh, or aquaponic uh, vertical farms that will produce organic food. We have to really rethink our food bill, our, our, uh, our farm bill. And for New Jersey in particular, it's about a billion dollar a year industry. We're the top producers of different fruits and vegetables here. Uh, We have almost a million acres of farmland. And um, so to to me, what we really have to do is invest in sustainable organic farming. Uh, Our current food bill actually subsidizes corn and cotton. And I don't know when the last time anybody ate cotton was, but it does not belong in a food bill. You know, um, we actually do not subsidize organic farming. It accounts for less than 1% of our farm bill and our, and our investments there. Uh, and we have to change that because, you know, organic farming is uh, pesticide free. And to reduce the costs, indoor vertical farming essentially allows you to use no pesticides because it's an indoor contained environment. And if we construct these across the country, they can be community, community owned, uh, community, create thousands of community jobs. And also we could feed the people who need it the most. And we could also provide low cost organic food for everybody. So everybody wins. Um, so that's another part of the, our platform. Uh, there's, there's so many things like we have to expand disability rights. We have to fight for digital privacy rights. Uh, I believe in regulating cryptocurrencies and clarifying tax issues there. Um, you know, and also free public college. Of course, we need that and canceling student loan debt. Because if we want to be competitive on a world stage, we have to have a well-educated workforce. And to, to really uh, in debt like 50 million Americans uh, and tie them to this uh, like sometimes six-figure student loan debts is, is, uh, is unacceptable to me. I mean, personally, I have student loans as well. My wife and I have them. And, you know, uh, we're, we're really lucky that we, that we were, able to, um, were able to afford like a lot of things of modern life. But I, I just – think that it's a drain on the economy. And if we unlock that economic potential by forgiving the student loan debt and canceling it fully, then we'll have a, an, an, insanely, uh, an insane economic boost in the next few years, which pays for itself over a decade. 
Yeah, that's that's really encouraging to hear. I totally agree with the student loan thing. Um, I have student loan debt that um, if it were canceled, I can guarantee I would stimulate the economy. And I think a lot of millennials would agree with that. So it's it's an economic Absolutely. stimulus that we desperately need. And just to allow millennials like our generation to have that economic mobility or start at like just less burden even. I mean, that in and of itself would be remarkable. So you are running against someone who I think is a political behemoth, Frank Pallone. He's really mm -hmm. one of the worst. I think a lot of people know about Frank Pallone who watch this show. But if they don't, tell us why you think Frank Pallone needs to be primaried. I, I think that you have a lot of things to go off of. But like in your mind, what's like the top reasons why you think he should be primaried. And I, I love that in your ad, you hit him for all the financial contributions that he takes. But uh, what do you think it is about Frank Pallone that makes him unable to represent his constituents adequately? So, uh, so honestly, in my opinion, our election, our primary is probably in the top four or five most important uh, elections in the country. And that's because Frank Pallone chairs the Energy and Commerce Committee in the House. So he's the chairman, and a lot of people don't really understand what powers a chairman of a committee has. So anyone can introduce a bill to a house, the House floor, but then it's assigned to a specific committee with jurisdiction. The Energy and Commerce Committee has jurisdiction of about 60% of all the legislation that passes through the House of Representatives. So bills like Medicare for All and the Green New Deal, they both wind up in his committee, and he has been actively blocking those bills. He, he had a hearing on health insurance uh, in June and did not even bring Medi the Medicare for All bill, HR 1384, you know, to the Jayapal proposal. He did not even bring that to the hearing. He did not bring it to the committee. And it's essentially going to be stopped there forever. He took $1 million from the pharmaceutical industry and the health insurance lobbies last cycle alone. And they're still funding his elections. Uh, he will never, ever pass Medicare for all. And he will be the person in power that can effectively stop it. Even if we have Bernie Sanders in the White House, he can stop Medicare for all through his committee. Uh, he could stop the Green New Deal from his committee as well. He is, he is uh, actually, I think he might have the sole jurisdiction over the Green New Deal bit, uh, bill if we propose one. And um, he actually has proposed his own uh essentially do nothing plan 100% uh, carbon neutral by 2050, which we know will be about 20 years too late. And it will allow for natural gas investments to continue for the next uh, 30 years. And that's not something that we our planet can take. That's not something that, that we can compromise on. We have to end the investments in fossil fuels. Uh, and he's taken a million dollars over the course of his career from the fossil fuel industry. So fundamentally, uh, because he takes this money and because of his position, he will never, ever give any votes for the progressive ideals that we want to fight for. And replacing him on the Energy and Commerce Committee would be hugely instrumental to passing a progressive platform in 2020 and beyond. And I, I honestly believe anyone who takes fossil fuel money deserves a primary challenge because they will not regulate the fossil fuel companies the way that we need to in the, in the next few years. Um, and, you know, if we really care about, uh, about these progressive ideals, which we really do, uh, we have to replace the corporate Democrats that will propose middle of the ground, do nothing, uh, half-ass solutions. And so that's really uh, important to our district as well. We have many miles, like 30 miles of coastline um, in our district. And the climate crisis is going to destroy our homes. We literally have houses a few feet from the Atlantic Ocean. From the Atlantic Ocean, we we have houses a few feet from from bay areas. So the rising sea level is, is very concerning for the people here. And in his recent town hall, almost every single person asked him one of two questions: Will you support Medicare for all, or will you support the Green New Deal? And his answer was no, 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 a thousand times. Blaming it on the Republicans. Blaming it on Blaming it on his donors that are going to run run ads against him. He called Medicare for all socialism. He is afraid of the very people that fund his campaign. He's afraid of their campaign ads calling him a socialist. Like 
for Medicare for all. They call, they called Obamacare socialism. You know, that argument doesn't hold any water when we have 45,000 people in our district alone without health insurance. So we're fighting for Medicare for all and the Green New Deal. Those are the two most important issues for our district. And we're going to replace them in June 2020. So I'm excited. That's great. Well, and I wanted to ask you because, you know, I feel like anyone who's in that district, there's no way that they enjoy putting up with him. Like, this is a fairly blue district. Like, you don't have to put up with someone who is this conservative, this right wing, quite frankly. And everyone in the country, they really have a vested interest in seeing you succeed because this is something that doesn't just affect that district that you're living in. I mean, it certainly affects you the most. But I mean, if he's a barrier to Medicare for all, then absolutely, we all have to coalesce around your campaign and get him out of office. But what I wanted to ask you was, what do you think it would take? Because you're not taking corporate cash, and he is, so he's going to have that monetary advantage. What do you think it would mm -hmm. take to make you uh, viable uh, in 2020? Because I know you're knocking on a lot of doors, but how much do you think you'd have to raise in order to be competitive? Uh, to be competitive, if we raise $150,000, we will definitely be uh, extremely com competitive. Uh, and, you know, if we, if we go up to 300 k then I think that we are, we're going to win the election. Uh, because... Uh, we have we have a district that's pretty pretty wide, right? So uh, it traces the the coastal shoreline very narrowly. So it's geographically long, uh, but we do have urban areas. We have uh, very dense urban areas. So, but we can we can win with really not much money, and this is a safe democratic district. Uh, the cook uh, the cook rating is like plus nine. Uh, so there's really no reason for our representative to be taking this corporate cash. Uh, especially because he wins against the Republicans every single year in like, like almost uh, in five, five, five figures or six figures ahead in votes. So, yeah, uh, basically, we don't need that much money, but we, we definitely need a little bit. We have campaign staff, volunteers right now, a few paid. Uh, I am now I'm part time at my at my job to dedicate to for at least four days a week, plus every weeknight. Um to our campaign. So we're hitting the ground running, though, starting in uh, right after this November 5th election, which is just a few days away. I kind of feel like every single primary challenger will win hands down if every voter knows about you, because I think that the pitch that you're making, it makes sense. It's going to resonate with people. It's just a matter of will people actually know who you are or will they just vote based on name recognition? What's the response that you've gotten from constituents? Because I can't imagine that in a deep blue district like that, they're too happy with Frank Pallone. Uh, no, so they're not. Uh, every, every single person that I speak to are very excited about uh, the Green New Deal, how it's a jobs program, how it's going to save our planet. And also Medicare for All makes a lot of sense to most people who have dealt with health, pro health issues. Um, so uh, people are very responsive here. I think our district pulls extremely well with all of our progressive ideas. Um, and I mean, this district deserves to be represented by somebody with bold policy platforms that will stand up to the billionaire class. And that's what that's what I'm fighting for. We have to stand up to those in power and demand equality and justice for everybody in our district. There's so many people that work um on the minimum wage here, almost 100,000 people. And that's why I believe in a loving wage, a raising the, the minimum wage to $20 an hour plus indexed to inflation, because um, if we want to stimulate the economy, that's the best way to do it, which is really interesting. I think just yesterday, there's been a study on the New York City minimum wage increase to $15 an hour in the restaurant industry. And uh, they've, they've found that it's actually increased employment and increased uh, restaurant spending. So it's a boom on the economy if we raise the minimum wage. Our minimum wage in New Jersey is going to up to $15 an hour in 2024. Uh, but I think that, I, I don't even think that's enough for that time period. And why are we waiting until 2024, which should just be happening now? Um, so yeah, all of our issues are very popular. Um, so, but you know, uh, challenging incumbent, the, uh, the establishment people know him very well. But I still have conversations with them. And a lot of people that are even elected officials have shown like, you know, like respect. They're, they're basically like, 
yeah, I, I, they respect what we're doing because we deserve a primary. We deserve options. This is a democracy, and the more options, the better. And so people everywhere have been responding well to our campaign. So That's really encouraging to hear. Let me ask you this, because if you're elected, we already know that you will be one of the main targets of Donald Trump, of Fox News. You'll be a member of the squad, a new member of the squad, round two. Um, you'll be deemed you know, a socialist, possibly a communist by Fox News. What do you do to basically push through that noise and still fight for an agenda? And on top of that, how do you basically push back against internal forces within the Democratic Party who's going to try to get you to soften your stance on a number of issues? So the internal uh, infighting will, will be very interesting because that's what I'm really worried about. Like, I, I think that we're going to Democrats are going to win the presidency. I think that Democrats are going to win the Senate and the and the House. But I'm really afraid of just the centrist corporate Democrats being the ones with the reins of power. And it's going to be another like Obama uh, rehash where we don't get much done, where we um, where, where we pretty much stall. And every single uh, working populist platform is pretty much uh, um, pretty much catapulted into, uh, you know, non-existence really. Uh, I mean, we, we need to get the, the anti-corruption bill reform passed. Uh, that's a very, very big priority. And I actually intend on, uh, being very aggressive against, uh, Republicans, uh, who, who I, I want, I want to be firing the first shots against them instead of being always on the defense. I think that's very powerful with Donald Trump against Donald Trump and Republicans because, uh, we have to put them on the back foot and really make them defend their positions because we have the popular platforms. We, we're calling for good jobs. We're calling for unions. We're calling for saving the planet. We're calling for uh, health care for all. What, what, are, what are they arguing for? Health care for less? Uh, like, you know, the, yeah, the right to work laws must be abolished. We have to abolish those everywhere. So I think so I'm going to be one of the biggest anti-corruption Democrats calling out even people in our own party who take that money, especially when they won't vote for uh, working class reforms like, uh, you know, like a higher minimum wage. And I'm going to be bringing the fight to Republicans, too, on their doorsteps. You know, Bernie Sanders actually recently said that he's going to be holding rallies in uh, other you know, in other districts with what, against whoever uh, won't vote for things that we want to get done, like, you know, like the Green New Deal. And I, I intend on doing a similar thing. Go, I will rally in somebody else's district, uh, working people, uh, and make sure that they feel the public pressure. I'll also, you know, uh, I want to help uh, organ, organizing everywhere. I don't want to just, this is, this is really a, about the movement. This is not about Russ. This is about our movement here. We're building this movement in New Jersey because we've been, uh, progressives have been really scattered across the state. But we're actually really building um, building coalitions across the board. So that's important to do in our state. Uh, we're going to start here first, and then we're going to keep bringing it nationally. And empowering other people to organize, I think, is the most important thing that we can do. Because uh, you know, I believe in leading from behind. I believe in um, you know, I don't I don't want the spotlight. I, I want this to be people's uh, the people's movement, and we have to empower each other and and work together everywhere. I love that answer because. Like when I ask that question occasionally to candidates, like what I really want to hear is I'm going to fight them. Like I'm going to fight Republicans. I'm going to fight Democrats. I'm going to call them out because like advocating for policies, that's incredibly important in and of itself. But we need people who are going to get in there and crack schools. So I always try <laughs> to see if I can get that sense from a candidate. And the fact that you affirm that it really makes it clear that, I mean, this isn't even a choice. Like, if people know about you, you're winning hands down. So I want you to make your pitch because basically this is about name recognition. If people know about you in New Jersey's 6th Congressional District, you win, I think, hands down. It's just a matter of getting the name out there. And unfortunately, you know, a fact of reality is you need money to do that. So tell us what we can do to help you, where we can donate and how we can get involved with your campaign, because I think that anyone who's watching this will be convinced and they're going to want to help you out. So what can we do? Yeah, so we have a really good website with all of our policies there. It's Russ for us 2020.com, R-U-S-S-F-O-R-U-S 2020.com. Uh, there's a volunteer form there where we, we're looking for volunteers across the country. Uh, we need help online organizing and also, um, you know, getting the message out more. So definitely sign up there. You, there's a donate link there. We definitely appreciate any contributions because we're a grassroots or people funded, taking no corporate cash. And uh, so about me, I have the experience as a 
as a legislator as well. So we, we need a legislator. We also need a public advocate. And so being like a public interest attorney fighting for the common good, I've drafted laws uh, in New York, actually, that have passed that protect tenants from manufactured homes. So I have experience as a legislator. And we definitely need more like good guy attorneys in Congress, good, good guy lawyers that have the fight that have the back of the people. Um, you know, I was a waiter for almost a decade before through college and through law school, working 40 hours a week. So I've been there on the on the working struggle uh, and the working class struggle. Um, I've worked alongside, you know, uh, immigrants and other college students and and moms and 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 people of all types. Uh, so that's that's really why I have a fundamental belief, the fundamental beliefs that I have here, where we need a working class movement. We need unions. We need higher minimum wages. Um, and, you know, uh, our 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 movement is about continuing the work of the people here. We're continuing the work that Bernie Sanders is doing. We're, we're linking up with everyone. We're building power here. And we appreciate any contribution, of course. But this moment in time is the most important ever because right now our future selves are watching us and we're going to ask ourselves when the Amazon was on fire, when California was on fire, when there were massive hurricanes everywhere, what were we doing to stop it, to fight it, to bring a new movement to clean up our environment? And now is the time to be involved. It doesn't have to be very, very dedicated. If you, if you can spare a few hours a week, every campaign locally could definitely use the help. And Mike, I thank you so much for having me here. Um, and, you know, like I said, our campaign is super important nationally and we need all the help we can get because we're a small team right now. We've raised about $15,000, but we're, we're, we're really, um, we're only about 10% of the way we, where we have to be. So, um, yeah, so we're going, we're going to win. Bernie Sanders is going to win. Our progressive movements are going to win. And it might as well be right now in the next election, you know? Absolutely. Well, look, anyone who's watching this knows it's not even a debate. You are hands down better than Frank Pallone. And I'm confident like with with all of these people, I was telling Russ before we started that for the first time, I actually feel a little bit optimistic just because there's so many <laughs> great candidates running for Congress. So like my cynical heart is starting to kind of like, you know, it's starting to grow a little bit, right? Not too much, but a little bit just seeing everyone kind of get involved. So let's help Russ help us. Let's get him elected. Russ Sirincione. He is someone who can actually change the country. Russ, thank you so much for coming on. You're welcome, Mike. Thank you for having me and good night, everybody. Well, that's it. I don't have anything left to uh, talk about. I've got, you know, everything off of my chest. So we'll go ahead and leave that there. As usual, I want to thank all of our Patreon, PayPal, and YouTube members for supporting the show. We absolutely cannot do this without your support. So thank you all so much for helping us to not just survive, but thrive as well. You guys are absolutely amazing. And shout out to all of our loyal listeners on SoundCloud and iTunes. You guys are also not to be forgotten. Thank you for listening. Um, I think I, I'll leave that there. I don't have anything else to say. So uh, I'm just going to start rambling as I usually do towards the end of episodes once I exhaust all of my mental space. I'm, I'm rambling now. I'm doing it. Um, but yeah, <laughs> I'm done. Um, I'll see you all next week. Hopefully you guys uh, will have a great weekend. Take care, everyone. Beta male.